The meeting will come to order. Without the ob objection, the chair is authorized to declare recess of the committee at any time. Pursuant to notice, I call up H.R. 5803, the Washington, D.C. Admission Act. The clerk will report the resolution. H.R. 5803 to provide for the admissions of the state of Washington, D.C. into the union. Without objection, the bill is considered read and open to amendment at any point. The chair recognizes herself to offer an amendment in the nature of a substitute. Uh, copies of the amendment have already been distributed and are on the dais. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 5803 offered by Ms. Maloney of New York. Without objection, the amendment is considered read and will serve as base text for purposes of amendment. I recognize myself for five minutes on the amendment. Good morning and welcome to all of our distinguished guests. Today is an historic day for our country and our democracy. For the first time in a generation, we will vote on whether hundreds of thousands of American citizens will finally have their voices counted in Congress. Today we will vote on whether to honor the most fundamental principles of this nation, principles on which a revolution was launched, principles for which countless patriots gave their lives, and principles that our founders enshrined in the Declaration of Independence. No taxation without representation and consent of the governed. Today we will vote on whether to allow the people of the District of Columbia to, to, to do what they overwhelmingly want to do, join in this great union as the 51st state of the United States of America. I can think of no more honorable or patriotic endeavor than taking up this legislation today to give the people of the district the same rights enjoyed by hundreds of millions of other Americans across our country. The United States is a democracy, but its capital is not. The United States is the only democratic country that denies both voting rights in the national legislature and local self-government to the people of its capital. Ladies and gentlemen, as simply as I can say, this is absolutely wrong. It violates everything we stand for as Americans. The district pays more in federal taxes than 22 states and more per capita than any state. Think about it. It pays more than nearly half the states in this country, yet DC residents have no vote in Congress. That is wrong. The district has a larger population than two states, and it has a higher per capita personal income and gross domestic product than any state, any state. Yet DC residents cannot consent to the federal laws that govern them. That is wrong. The district's annual budget is bigger than 12 state budgets, and its bond rating is better than 50, 35 states. It's better. Yet DC residents cannot give final consent to their own laws. That is wrong. The people of the district have been fighting for equal rights for more than 200 years. In 2016, an overwhelming 86% of DC residents voted for statehood. They exercised their right to petition Congress to remedy this unfairness, and now we have an obligation to do so. I am very proud to be an original co-sponsor of this bill, which now has a record 223 co-sponsors. This landmark legislation is strongly supported by our Democratic colleagues from Virginia and Maryland, including the majority leader, Mr. Hoyer, who has committed to bringing this legislation to the floor, where I believe it will pass for the first time in history. Unfortunately, so far, Republicans have opposed our efforts, and they have offered several arguments. They argue that DC is too corrupt to govern itself. They cite the actions of a few former DC elected officials and they try to tar the entire population 
with their wrongs. At the same time, they failed to mention criminal convictions of corrupt officials in their own states, and they omit the recent criminal convictions of members of their own conference. All jurisdictions have an obligation to ensure that their officials serve the interests of their people. That obligation is no different in the district than in Ohio, North Carolina, or any other state. Their second argument is more ominous. They would rather deny voting rights and self-government for hundreds of thousands of American citizens than even consider the possibility that the two senators from the new state could be Democrats. Think about that argument. They're willing to violate the core principles of our democracy merely because the new senators might be from a different political party? This argument is anti-democratic and anti-American. The question for Republicans are these. Do you truly believe in no taxation without representation? Do you truly believe in states' rights? Do you truly believe that the federal government should stay out of local affairs? In 2007, Mike Pence, our current vice president, and our former colleague in the House of Representatives said this, and I quote, the fact that more than half a million Americans living in the District of Columbia are denied a single voting representative in Congress is clearly a historic wrong. The single overreaching principle of the American founding was that laws should be based upon the consent of the governed. The first generation of Americans threw tea in Boston Harbor because they were denied a voting representative in the national legislature in England. Given their commitment to representative democracy, it is inconceivable to me that our founders would have been willing to accept the denial of representation to so great a throng of Americans in perpetuity." End quote. Are these just words, or do they mean something? Because if we truly believe these words, we need to do more than just say them. We need to do more than just repeat them. We must act on them. We must make them a reality, and that is exactly what we hope to do today. Finally, before I close, I want to commend Congresswoman Eleanor Holmes Norton. She has been tireless, and she has been compelling. She is the author not only of this legislation, but of this moment in history. We thank her for her dedication and her service. I now recognize the distinguished ranking member, the gentleman from the great state of Ohio, Mr. Jordan. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's not about which party senators may or may not come from if the District of Columbia were a state. It's about the Constitution. It's always what it's been about. And frankly, when we're talking about something this serious, it might be better to have more than just one hearing on the, on the subject matter before we move to a markup. I understand and appreciate that the supporters of this bill strongly believe the District of Columbia should become the 51st state. But as many of us have pointed out during the one and only hearing on this topic, there are serious constitutional as well as policy problems with this proposal. The founders intentionally crafted the Constitution so the seat of the federal government would purposefully and specifically not, not be within any state. As Jay Madison articulated in Federalist Number 43, if the capital city was situated within a state, the federal government would be subject to undue influence by that host state. Pretty common sense. These guys knew what they were doing. The bill puts the new federal enclave entirely within and subject to the influence of the new state, the state of the District of Columbia. In addition, going back to 1963, the Justice Department has consistently, consistently stated during both Republican and Democrat administration, administrations that Congress cannot admit D.C. as a state legislatively. Here's the reason. The Constitution does not distinguish between the seat of the federal government and the district where the government is seated. The only way to overcome this problem would be to amend the Constitution. The proponents of this legislation want us to ignore that fundamental truth. In order for the district to become the 51st state, Congress needs to pass and the states need to ratify an amendment to the Constitution. 
However, a Gallup poll from just last year found that only 29 percent of Americans support D.C. statehood, meaning that this proposal stands no chance of garnering the widespread support necessary for ratifying an amendment to the Constitution. In addition to the constitutional problems with this legislation, there are equally serious policy concerns. The legislation under consideration today, and particularly the 60 pages of new text that Republicans got just four days ago, demonstrates the district's unpreparedness for statehood. Several of the provisions continue the federal government's requirement to fund district programs, including the new state's pension and court system, until the new state has laws in effect to provide for these services. So this bill would allow the district's special federal funding to continue indefinitely with no incentives to encourage the, quote, new state to work toward fiscal self-sufficiency. This issue deserves an honest discussion about the history that gave rise to the present situation regarding the district. 1995, due to financial crisis brought about by corruption and mismanagement, the federal government had to take control of the D.C. budget. No one can say with a straight face that the situation has improved to the point that the district is now self-sustainable. Taxpayers nationwide in Ohio, West Virginia, Tennessee, and Texas currently foot the bill for the district courts, its unfunded pension liabilities, and the care and custody of district prisoners. The district also, also receives other subsidies from federal government, including $45 million for the improvement of the D.C. public school system. But the Democrats have no interest in confronting these issues. The bill just continues to kick the can down the road. I look forward to the debate this morning, and I anticipate that we can and will offer several amendments, but I hope that in the future we can get serious about addressing some of the pressing issues facing D.C.'s finances and some of the other problems that the district has. Madam Chair, I yield back. Madam Chair, thank you. I, I now uh, recognize the sponsor of this legislation, the gentlewoman from the District of Columbia, Ms. Eleanor Holmes Norton. Uh, thank you, Chair, Chairwoman Maloney. Along with the citizens of the District of Columbia, I greatly appreciate the hearing we held last September and this markup today appropriately, the same week we celebrate the birthdays of President Abraham Lincoln and Frederick Douglass, two champions of the rights uh, of, the, of the residents of the District of Columbia. This has been a historic year for D.C. statehood, culminating in today's markup. When I introduced the bill on the first day of Congress, I did so with a record 155 original co-sponsors. Today, the bill has a record 223 co-sponsors, enough to pass in the House with co-sponsors alone. Moreover, we also have a record 35 co-sponsors of the Senate version of the bill, and we are especially grateful to its sponsor, Senator Tom Carper. Over 100 national organizations with strong records of getting bills passed in the Senate are already preparing to help us take the fight to the Senate. Last March, the House passed H.R. 1, Representative Sawbanes for the People Act, which contained extensive findings supporting D.C. statehood, marking the first time in American history either chamber of Congress has endorsed D.C. statehood. Polls show that most Americans think the residents of the nation's capital have the same rights they enjoy. Even some members of Congress may not know that the district ranks first in the nation in federal taxes paid to support the national government, making the residents of, that, of the nation's capital the only full tax paying Americans not treated as equal citizens. The district pays more in federal taxes than 22 states. DC has a higher per capita personal in, and gross national pro product than any state. The district's unequal status can be rectified only by our statehood build. The district's local economy has become one of the strongest in the nations. Today, the district is more than equal to states financially. Its $15.5 billion budget is larger than the budget of 12 states. For two decades, the district has had balanced budgets and clean audit opinions. Moody Investor Service has given the district's general obligation bonds its highest rating of AAA. Its per capita personal income expenditures are higher than those of any state, and its total personal consumption expenditures are greater than those of seven states. The population of the district continues to grow, a year ago passing 700,000 for the first time since 1975. The population of the, the, the district is larger than 
that of Wyoming and Vermont, and is in league with seven states that had a population under one million in the last census. D.C. residents have fought and died in, in every American war, including the war that led to the creation of the nation, the Revolutionary War. The district suffered more casualties than a number of states during the wars of the 20, 20th century, but I could not vote on final passage of the National Defense Authorization Act last year. The veterans of the nation's capital have helped get voting rights for people throughout the world, but continue to come home without those same rights or even the same rights as veterans with whom they served. Our statehood bill is clearly constitutional. Congress has the authority to make Washington Douglas Com Commonwealth a state under Article 4, Section 3, Clause 1. Its power to admit new states to the Union, combined with its Article 1, Section 8, Clause 17 power over the seat of government. The Congressional Research Service and even conservative legal scholar uh, and practitioner Via Din, who served in the Department of Justice during the George W. Bush administration, have issued expert opinions that H.R. 51 is constitutional. Congress can carve out areas where D.C. residents live as the 51st state and reserve other areas as the national capital. The Congress has two choices. It can continue to exercise undemocratic authority over 700 thousand American citizens who live in the nation's capital, treating them, in the words of Frederick Douglass, as aliens, not citizens, but subjects. Or it can live up to the nation's promise and ideals in taxation without representation and pass the Washington, D.C. Admission Act. Thank you very much, uh, Chairwoman Maloney, for your leadership. Thank you. Uh, the gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Higgins is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Madam Chairwoman, with all due respect to my colleague that has presented this, this legislation on, in this hurried markup today, and with great respect for my fellow Americans that have a passionate support for this endeavor, we as a body, despite the, the, the passion or perhaps the fantastic idea of a particular passion that is driven through the national narrative and supported by many Americans, we, we cannot just step away from the constitutional obligations to follow the document that founded our nation and specifically address the formation of our nation's capital and the means by which states are accepted into our union. There are many, many in this body that support term limits. Let's just have a markup for term limits. We can't do that. It calls for a constitutional amendment. Let's balance the budget. I voted for that amendment twice in my service to we the people. Let's just mark the balanced budget up next week. We can't do that. It calls for a constitutional amendment. Let's do away with the Electoral College. Why not? It's unpopular on Facebook. Let's mark it up next week. <laughs> it would call for a constitutional amendment. Section 8 of Article 1, very powerful section, including giving Congress the right to the power to lay and collect taxes, to declare war, to raise and support armies. It falls within Section 8 to exercise, and I quote, exclusive legislation in all cases whatsoever over such district as may by session of particular states and the acceptance of Congress become the seat of the government of the United States. Originally, Virginia and Maryland, sovereign states ceded land for the formation of our nation's capital. Sometime later, 1846, Virginia wanted their land back and they got it. In order to have any of this move forward, would, it would first have to be considered by the, by the citizens of the sovereign state which ceded this land to begin with, and then there'd have to be a constitutional amendment. 
Article 3, Section 3, new states may be admitted by the Congress into this union, but no new state shall be formed or erected within the jurisdiction of any other state, nor any state be formed by the junction of two or more states or parts of states without the consent of the legislature of the states concerned, as well as of the Congress. May I say that our Constitution is clear. If you want to form a 51st state, and knock yourself out. Follow the constitutionally mandated process to make that happen. This would call for an amendment to our Constitution as ratified by a sufficient number of the several states. And before that could happen, the land that was ceded to the United States for our capital to begin with by the sovereign state of Maryland, that would have to be returned to the citizens of Maryland and their state legislature. I have a, a great compassion and understanding. I've met with men and women, American solid patriots, that support this, this move, the 51st state. I'm not against it whatsoever. I stand for all of the American people when I say, let us consider this, yes. But I, I, I implore the chairwoman mm -hmm. to withdraw this markup. Let us have further significant hearings considering the very serious constitutional implications of moving forward with a markup, stepping away from our constitutional responsibilities to consider any endeavor is the first failure of a committee. This is what we witnessed today. Madam Chair, I yield my remaining 39 seconds to the ranking member. Thank the gentleman for his comments. He yield back. Who seeks recognition? Mr. Conley. Mr. Conley is recognized for five minutes. I thank the distinguished chairwoman. And I'm honored to be here today to try to right a wrong. You've heard some neat arguments just now, and they might actually have a point if the behavior that preceded those arguments was consistent with the arguments. But at every turn when my friends on the other side have had a chance to give voting privileges and voting rights here in the Congress to the District of Columbia, they've said no. As soon as they became the majority, what did they do? They denied Ms. Norton the right to vote in the, in the, uh, uh, on the floor when we were in the House. So much for sincerity. So much for commitment to representation of 700,000 people. You heard the distinguished ranking member talk about do it right, do a constitutional amendment. Does anyone in this room really think he'd vote for a constitutional amendment? I heard the distinguished member from Louisiana lecture us about what the Constitution means. DC did not exist when we wrote the Constitution. It was an abstract idea and was thought of as a very simple, small administrative capital somewhere in the banks of the Potomac because that's where George Washington wanted it. They never envisioned a municipality with 700,000 fellow Americans disenfranchised. That would be a right, a wrong, that those founders, I believe, would have corrected. We also heard from the distinguished member from Louisiana lecture us about the history of statehood. And he read to us the fact that no part of an existing state could become a state. Well, that would come as news, I'm sure, to my friend from West Virginia. Because during the Civil War, the western part of my state was wrenched from it, and Congress approved it as a state. And that's how Ms. Miller is here today. And my state, Virginia, didn't get back my seat, the 11th district, until 1992. Took almost 100 years to get it back. Actually, 130 years. Kansas and Nebraska helped trigger the Civil War, that fight over statehood. How would they be admitted? 
slave or free. Bloody wars were fought over that issue. We have a checkered history about statehood. But at the end of the day, one thing is clear. Everyone in this country is entitled to representation. No exceptions. No hiding behind constitutional sanctimony. We're here today to right a wrong. To finally give a voice, a, represent, a representational voice, to 700,000 fellow Americans. I represent the district next door to the District of Columbia. I spent 25 years of my life working with DC in a regional cooperative effort. And it's pained me every day I've served in public office that my fellow citizens right across the river are denied their rightful voice here in the United States Congress. And that sentiment is shared by my fellow citizens in Virginia. They see the wrong, they recognize it, and they want something done about it. And finally, the argument that we're rushing to judgment. Lord almighty, we only got four days notice on a draft bill. Where have you been for 200 years? When, pray tell, would it be timely? If not now, when? I applaud the chairwoman and the distinguished delegate, congresswoman from the District of Columbia for seizing this moment and finally saying enough. It's time to right this wrong and give 700,000 fellow Americans their rightful place in the United States Congress. Would the gentleman yield? Uh, my time is up. Who seeks recognition? Mr. Gibbs is recognized for five minutes. Well, I just, I just really have a question there for the, <coughs> the gentleman from Virginia. If the gentleman yields, I'd be glad to try to answer his question. Yep, yep. Um, you know, you talk about right and the wrong. Uh, tell me if I'm correct or not. My understanding is when the Founding Fathers set this up, we, we know why they did it, because they didn't want states to have undue, a state to have undue pressure on the federal government. We've heard that argument. But then it's also my understanding that back in the day, that people that live on the, quote, the, for better, lack of a term, the Virginia side or the Maryland side were able to vote for that senator, the respective senator, if they were on the Virginia side or the Maryland side. So they did have representation. Is that, is that correct? Do you know about that? It, it, I'm not quite sure I understand the question. Certainly the 700,000 residents in well, the I district. Well, I, I think, I think uh, my understanding was when it was originally set up, when D.C. was set up, the residents of D.C. could vote for a U.S. senator, depending on it might have been a Virginia senator or it might have been a Maryland senator. I, I, I know the answer to that. Okay. Uh, for, for the 10 years of transition, in order to keep uh, the states that contributed to the land from losing their vote, they maintained their vote until 1801 when the land was transferred and became the nation's capital. And at that time, the nation's capital got no vote. That was simply to make sure that Virginia and Maryland didn't so they were denied their vote their vote. during the transition period. But, but, what, but to my friend's go, go ahead for, take to, to my friend's question, clearly what we're dealing with today is 700,000 people in D.C. vote neither in Maryland nor Virginia. And that is the wrong we're trying to correct. I, I, uh, ranking member wants to make a comment, I think. Well, I would just say that the gentleman from Virginia said, where have we been uh, in, in reference to the legislation? The, I, I would ask them the question, where have you been? You're, you're, you're the one who added 60 pages to the bill you introduced a year ago uh, last Friday. That was our point. Uh, if, if this is all so well understood and everything's settled, why'd you add 60 pages four days ago to the bill that we just, just got to see? So if you got everything figured out and you introduced this bill a year ago, why suddenly the 60 page change from last, uh, last Friday? I yield back to the gentleman. Well, I, I think that, uh, you know, statehood is, is a different issue. Our founding fathers were pretty adamant of what the uh, consequences might be and the issues might be. And uh, the, the vote, the right for the, the 700,000 people here in D.C. have the right to vote, you know, we ought to be thinking of a, of a program like they set up during the transition program and, and let them have, be able to vote for their senators in, in that respect. So I yield back. Who seeks recognition? The gentleman from Maryland. Congressman Raskin is recognized. Move to strike the last word. 
Many thanks, uh, Madam Chair, and thanks to uh, Congresswoman Eleanor Holmes Norton for bringing this to the agenda. Um, I'm going to try to do what um, I do best, which is clear up a little constitutional confusion that may be on the floor here right now. Um, the, America began with 13 states, the 13 original colonies. We've admitted 37 states, which means the vast majority of the states came in after. None of them have been admitted by constitutional amendment. All of them have been admitted by a simple act of Congress, which is what is being proposed here in the statehood legislation. Now, my good friend from Louisiana uh, invokes the district clause, which is Article 1, Section 8, Clause 17, which says that Congress shall exercise exclusive legislation over the seat of government, the land that is ceded from other states. That is precisely the provision which gives Congress the power to modify the seat of government, as it did in 1846, as the gentleman pointed out. When the district was first formed by the cession of lands from Virginia in, and Maryland in 1791, when it was accepted during that decade when people continued to vote back in Maryland or Virginia, and then with the passage of the Organic Act in 1801, when, when that happened, um, it was very clear that Congress had the right to define the boundaries of the district. When the lands were retroceded to Virginia in 1846, that 10-mile square that fit the original constitutional language was shrunk. It was modified, and Congress had the clear power to do that, to modify uh, the, the land that is in the seat of government. That's precisely what's being proposed by the gentlelady's uh, legislation here, which is, again, to shrink the land and to cede the land to the new state, which would be admitted under our power under Article 4. Every state has been admitted by Congress under Article 4. And as the gentleman from Virginia points out, a number of states used to be part of other states. So Maine was once part of Massachusetts. Vermont was once part of New York. West Virginia was once part of Virginia. Kentucky was once part of Virginia. So we've uh, lost a lot. <laughs> the, the point I want to make is that when my state, in its patriotism and generosity, ceded the land to Congress for the purposes of the seat of government, certainly it was not anticipated that hundreds of thousands of people or millions of people over the centuries would be disenfranchised as a result of it. But in any event, we ceded the land in absolute fee simple in property terms. That is, we gave it to Congress the way that Virginia gave its land to Congress. Then it becomes up to Congress under its powers under the seat of government clause, under the district clause, to decide what to do with it. It can enlarge it, it can shrink it, it can uh, use it for other purposes. But we, if you go back and you look at that grant of land from Maryland to Congress, it was an absolute fee simple. It was an irrevocable grant of land to Congress to decide. So Congress has authority over what to do with it. Now, the reason why you have, I think, uh, the vast majority of the members of the Maryland delegation on Congresswoman Norton's legislation is because we believe in democratic self-government. We believe that everybody has a right to participate in America. Thomas Jefferson said that there would be territories in America, there would be land where people would not have political equality, but eventually they would come into political equality. That was the whole design of the Northwest Ordinance. The, the good gentleman from Ohio belongs to uh, a state that was not one of the original states. It was added on with the expansion westward. And of course, there were objections made that the people there weren't really ready for self-government and they weren't uh, really up to the task and so on. We've seen those kinds of arguments historically in America. But my God, is there any self-respecting member in this committee or in the chamber who would not be fighting, as Congresswoman Norton is, for the democratic equality and rights of her constituents? I don't think so. We're the only nation on earth where the residents of the capital city are disenfranchised in their national legislature. And our whole revolution was designed to combat the evils of what they called virtual representation, that the people in the colonies would be virtually represented by other people in parliament. The whole point of democracy is you get to choose your own leaders. 
you get to have the people that you want represent you and your interests and your values. So I can't even imagine what it was like for the people sitting in this audience today to be watching the impeachment trial in the Senate, knowing that they did not have anybody who was getting to vote on the person that they helped to elect or not to the presidency of the United States. So I yield back to the chair. Who seeks recognition? Mr. Green is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, in 1982, I took uh, the oath to defend the Constitution of the United States on the plane at West Point. Um, I was 17 years old. At the time, I didn't really know all the depth of what that meant. I didn't know where that oath would take me at the time, but it took me a lot of interesting places like Afghanistan and Iraq. When bullets are flying around you, uh, when there's the opportunity of dying, orphaning your children, you think about the oath you take. And my oath, the oath that the, the, the officers in the United States military take, the oath that we took, it's the identical oath that we took in this body, is to the Constitution of the United States. It is not to the people of this country. It is not to the geographic land. It is not to a state. We defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, bearing true faith and allegiance to the same. That is the oath I took. That is the oath that I defended on our nation's battlefields. Our Constitution is very clear. Based on Federalist 43, our founders recognized that where this seat of government sat, there'd be preferential treatment given, and there has been. You can look at some of the benefits that are afforded the folks in D.C. that other states don't have. It also has undue influence on the government itself, and that's clearly expressed in Federalist 43. And uh, Madam Chairwoman, I'd like to ask unanimous consent to admit Federalist 43 to the record. Granted. Okay. Thank you. I'll continue, uh, Madam Chairwoman. The, the, the Constitution is very clear that this land is unique and special, and all the other states that have been added are under a different criteria. They're under a different consideration because in the Constitution, in Federalist 43, it's clear. Even Thomas Jefferson traded away his opposition to Hamilton's uh, acquiring the state debts in order to make sure that New York, that that capital, the federal capital, moved out of the state. It is the appropriate and right thing that it be unique and special and on its own. And I, the, the constitutional oath, the oath that I took to defend that Constitution, I will continue to support. And, and suggestions that for unfairness sake or unpleasantness or name calling, it has nothing to do with that and has everything to do with the oath that I swore to defend the document of the Constitution of the United States, and I will keep my oath. Will, will the gentleman yield? Uh, yes. Um, the, 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 thank you for your eloquent statement. Does the gentleman believe that the specific plot of land that is to be the seat of government is defined by the Constitution? The Federalist 43, and I'd, I'd have to read the section from it, but I essentially the idea of the District of Columbia was set up so that we, there would not be undue influence by a single state on the, on the federal government. And that's the concept that I'm, I'm presenting. And the articulation of, regarding D.C. in the Constitution, I think, supports Federalist 43 and that concept. If you'd yield for another question. I, I, yes, sir. So um, does the gentleman believe that it was constitutional for Congress to redraw the boundaries of the District of Columbia uh, in 1846 when it subtracted land from the seat of government? I'd have to go and go back and look at that, and I apologize for not, not okay. being able to answer your question I, the, right now. The only thing I would suggest you think about is that the Constitution does not state 
where the seat of government will be or what size it must be. It can't be larger than 10 miles square, but it doesn't have a minimum. And so I think that uh, Congresswoman Norton's legislation addresses your concern because what she's saying is we're not going to make the district, we're not going to make the seat of government itself a state. We're going to redraw the boundaries and then yield it, the residential lands to the new state. If I could, Madam Chairwoman, uh, respond to that comment very quickly. I'll be very brief. Yes. yes. It, you know, just this building itself is not a seat of government. Uh, so if we draw the lines around the mall and around the Capitol building and the Supreme Court, I, I don't think we're accomplishing the intent. But I, I appreciate the comment. Thank you. I yield. Who seeks recognition? OK. Uh, the gentleman from Maryland, Congressman Sarbanes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. First of all, um, I, as others have done, want to congratulate um, Congresswoman Norton for her incredible efforts uh, over so many years. This is a momentous day, and I want to thank you for your advocacy on, on behalf of the residents of the District of uh, Columbia. My colleague a moment ago said that um, he took an oath, and we all take an oath, excuse me, to the Constitution, not to the people, but in effect, when you're taking an oath to the Constitution, to uphold the Constitution, you really are taking an oath to uphold the interests of the people, because it was we, the people, that founded the Constitution as instrument of their desire and their priorities. Um, and fundamental to that is the idea that you will have a voice in your democracy, that you will be heard that you will have representation, which of course has been denied to uh, the residents of the District of Columbia from the outset. That is the wrong, as my colleague Mr. Connolly said, that we are trying to write with this legislation. Um, I thank my colleague from Maryland uh, for the recent history lesson that he gave us. Um, I want to go back to the ancient Greeks who I will say immodestly invented democracy as a Greek American, I like to make that point. Um, the ancient Greeks um, premised their democracy on the idea that everyone would have a voice in the marketplace of ideas, the agora, the political town square. And we borrowed on that concept uh, as a founding principle of our republic. Today, there are many Americans who feel cynical about government, they feel angry and frustrated, they feel that their voice isn't heard and they've kind of fled the political town square um, voluntarily on their own initiative. And we have a responsibility to try to bring them back into the political town square to become active and engaged citizens again. That's at the heart of many of the reforms, the democracy reforms that Democrats have put forward in this Congress. But it has to be said that there are some Americans who actually are being kept out of the, forcibly kept out of the political town square. One, one mechanism for doing that is voter suppression, keeping people out of the political town square so their ideas cannot be part of this sort of pluralistic experiment of conversation, discussion, and debate. But another way you keep people out of that town square, that marketplace of ideas, is in this way. The residents of the District of Columbia are being forcibly prevented from stepping into the political town square where their voices can be heard. And it's an outrage. And that's what this legislation is designed to remedy so that the voices of 705,000 residents of the District of Columbia can finally be heard in this democracy, in this great experiment. And I, I am moved when I look at Section 102 of this legislation. Subsection A is titled, Issuance of Proclamation issuance of proclamation, which in every way is an, a proclamation of empowerment, because this is what that section says. 
This is what will happen if we can pass this legislation. Not more than 30 days after receiving certification of the enactment of this act from the President pursuant to Section 403, the Mayor, thank you for being here, Madam Mayor, the Mayor shall issue a proclamation for the first elections for two senators and one representative in Congress from the state subject to the provisions of this section. I can't wait for that day. Thank you, Congresswoman Norton, for your efforts in this regard, and I yield back. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen, for your beautiful words. Does, who else seeks uh, recognition? Mr. Heiss? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll keep my comments brief, but you know, to, the, to me, the whole issue comes down to the fact that, that our founders designed D.C., the seat of our federal government, in such a way that it would not be in a state. It was designed that way. So how can we come now to a discussion to say we're going to make it a state when the original intent was not even for it to be in a state, that it was a separate seat of government specifically outside of a state? And now we're going to say, no, let's make it a state of its own. That is clearly outside the boundaries and the intent of our founding fathers. And it was stated a, a moment ago that D.C. was not even uh, organized, created when the Constitution was written. That may be so, but that the concept clearly was there. That's why it's in the Constitution, Article 1. It's there because the intent was to have a seat of federal government that was not in a state, not influenced by a state, that was its own separate entity wherein our government could operate without outside influences. And it's just absolutely amazing to me that we we're having a discussion to create a state out of that which was not even allowed to be in a state, and that we would have that discussion in such a way that it doesn't even require a constitutional amendment. I, I, I just can't even wrap my mind around the, the process of where this committee is taking us. And with that, I'll yield back. Thank you. Who, who uh, seeks recognition? Chip Roy, Congressman. I thank the Chair. Um, from my vantage point on this, uh, the, the question for me is, is what is a state? And I was uh, interested in the reaction by the gentleman from Virginia when he said, I think somewhat under his breath and jokingly, or t uh, I don't know if it's a joke or not, he said he seconded the statement of my friend from Louisiana about uh, the Electoral College and that we should proceed with a vote in this body with respect to the Electoral College as opposed to following a constitutional process in order to change how we're established as a federal republic. There is a continued and ongoing assault from my colleagues on the left on the whole nature of our republic and what it means to be a republican, what it means to be a state. Uh, for the vast majority of our states, these are areas in which people came together living in communities and established their sovereign area or their state, whether it was a colony or whether it was a particular area, whether it was Alaska or whatever, and then at some point sought admission to the union. Now, I understand that there's no 100% bright lines on all of this. I, mean, I get that. But, but when you look at the essence of this, right, the District of Columbia was created for a reason. There was some wisdom in its founding and creation. That doesn't mean that it has to be per permanently that way for all time. But we are talking about the establishment of our nation's capital, a 10-square-mile squ area. Uh, there is a county called Loving, Texas, uh, Loving County, Texas, which is about 10 times the size of the District of Columbia. It's about 700 square miles. It has 67 people in it, or 85 or 72, it depends on when. That's how many people are in it. You've got the King Ranch, which is about 1,200 square miles. That's just one ranch in Texas. We can look at size of area, we can look at population centers, but if we think D.C. should be a state because it's got 700,000 people in it, despite the fact that the vast majority of those people chose to be in the state of, or to be in the District of Columbia, because they wanted to be there, living, working, et cetera, and it's a choice, it's the nation's capital. Being represented by Congress, by the way, in that process, uh, now to say that that should be a state, I think goes against the very structure of the republic that we've created 
from sovereign entities as we built this nation. As the gentleman from Virginia very well knows when he pointed out the whole issue with West Virginia, that is a complicated situation, but do we all agree that the Commonwealth of Virginia was not a part of the Union at the time? So to invoke the, the constitutional question with respect to the separation, whether you're taking land from a state, it is at least a debatable proposition given the fact that the capital of the Confederacy was in Richmond. The, the, the whole idea that that's analogous here, I think is a bit of a stretch at best, if not wholly uh, incomparable. So from my standpoint here, the question is just simply whether this small area cut out here from the District of Columbia should be a state which on the merits. And we had a debate on this through the constitutional process and it failed. And now we're trying to, in my view, backdoor it through a statutory process, leaving a small enclave which upends the very purpose of the 10 square mile area that was established by the founders as a separation from influences from the well, now 50 states, the uh, then number of states. And so uh, I think we should just go to the heart of this, right? Just go to the substance of it. Yeah, I know I will vote against a constitutional amendment. You're right when you're calling out my colleague from Louisiana. I, I do not believe that it should be a state. I believe that it's, I, I mean, I have no problem saying that. And I think that the people here are represented and I think the people here can move if they choose to. Uh, but I think we should follow the constitutional process. I think it should be a constitutional amendment question, given the 23rd Amendment and given the nature of how we created this District of Columbia as our nation's capital. But I have no problem saying that I think that it shouldn't be a state, Would and that the state does have, or that the district does have representation by virtue of the 23rd Amendment and the electoral uh, college process, uh, and then it does, in fact, have representation by this Congress, uh, and given a great deal of autonomy through home rule, um, which... We could have a whole other debate about that. Would my friend yield? I'd be happy to. I thank my friend, and I, I thank him for his uh, reasoned words. I would, with respect to West Virginia, I would simply make a correction. We fought a civil war over the very issue of the legitimacy of secession. Sure. Abraham Lincoln and the Union refused ever to recognize that legitimacy, and therefore, my state, Virginia, was not outside of the Union. It was an insurrection. But we were, as every part of the Union at the time, when West Virginia was created, as any other state, and according re to reclaiming, Abraham reclaiming Lincoln my and time, the I'll close on this, of course. Madam Chair. Is, and I, I, I accept and understand that reasoning as well, and I think it was an important part of what President Lincoln was doing, trying to hold the Union together. I completely understand that argument. What I would suggest, though, is it is clearly a very legally different concept and situation when you have Virginia at the time doing what it was doing, and a Congress in 1863 then reacting to the state of Virginia seceding, the, the capital of the Confederacy being in Virginia, and then Congress saying in 1863, West Virginia likes to separate, we're going to admit them into the Union statutorily, and therefore this whole idea of taking land from an existing state was a very different situation in the context of war and the Confederacy seceding uh, from the Union, even if you accept the, the, the argument you just made, which is well-reasoned, but I, I think it is a very different situation, and that's what I would just suggest to my friend from Virginia. Just a couple of points. First of all, as I said before, Washington, D.C. is not a state. It is a city, and it would be nothing like the other 50 states, okay? We are not a, a diverse area. You know, the state of Wisconsin has significant amount of tourism and natural beauty, big manufacturing state, big insurance state, big agriculture dairy state. Washington, D.C. is not sizable, and it's largely a government city with a little bit of tourism connected to the buildings around it. Um, and for that reason, our forefathers did not treat it like a state. It obviously is not. The second thing I'm going to point out is at least so far, um, rather than looking for bigger responsibilities, you look at the District of Columbia, which should be easy to govern, uh, particularly with all the, um, it's kind of recession proof due to all the government jobs. Um, it has a, a poor, permanent tourism base with the Capitol and all the other government buildings around here. 
But if you look at the amount of money spent by the government, it's kind of out of whack. At least, you know, playing a little bit around on the internet, I think it's the uh, second highest cost per pupil for spending on its schools. And you look around, there are different ways to measure it. I think their fourth grade leading, reading scores are tied for worst in the country with New Mexico. SAT scores are like third worst in the country. If it were a state, its murder rate would be the highest in the country, um, a bit bigger than Louisiana. So there's nothing, you know, that, that's another problem you have. But I think the thing to think about is, is it appear to be like a state? And it's clearly like a, a city. You wouldn't break off the city of Milwaukee and say we get two senators. That would make no sense. Or any other city in the country. Um, thank you. The gentleman yields back. Does anyone else? Who seeks the gentlelady from New Mexico, Deb Hadman? Thank you, Madam Chair. And also want to um, thank my colleague, uh, Ms. Norton, for her hard, hard work. Uh, I am in support of her bill. All this talk about land, I just felt it was important for me to recognize that this is Indian land and, um, and that the original inhabitants of this land, the Anacostans, actually no longer exist because when the colonizers came to this country, this area was the first place that they hit and um, they became extinct because of disease and war. And, and I'd also like to mention that our Constitution, our U.S. Constitution, is largely influenced by the Iroquois Confederacy, which, was, which is a group of five tribes that, um, one of the oldest democracies in the world, who gave every tribal citizen of their Confederacy a voice in how they would move forward for centuries and centuries. So um, we talk about land and we talk about, you know, fairness and democracy and all these things. And I just felt it was important that I recognize that there were people here long before it was um, anyone's state, uh, but that I am in full support of, of our brand of democracy, which means giving every person a voice, and so therefore I am in support of this bill, and I yield, Madam Chair. Thank you for that important point. Is there anyone else who seeks uh, recognition? If there are no further general debate, I... Oh, Tlaib, Tlaib, sorry. Tlaib, okay. <laughs> Congresswoman uh, Tlaib from the great state of Michigan. Thank you, Madam Chair. I do want to thank uh, my colleague, uh, Congresswoman uh, Norton, uh, uh, for her incredible leadership uh, to try to give a voice to many of the people she represents. And I um, also want to thank my colleague, Congressman Raskin, who always centers us on um, our history and the Constitution and the true intention there. And with that, I would like to yield the rest of my time to him. I, well, I appreciate that very much. Um, thank you, Ms. Tlaib. There are a few floating fallacies I would like to address. Uh, one is the idea that people in capital cities should not be represented and have the right to vote. Now think about your own state, whether it's uh, Austin, Texas, or Columbus, Ohio, or Albany, New York, or Sacramento, California. Would we say, because the people who live there breathe the same air as the state legislators do, that they should be disenfranchised from elections? I mean, the, the, the proposition is absurd, which is why America is the only democratic nation on earth that disenfranchises the people in the capital city. Can you imagine if the people in Paris, France, were disenfranchised in the National Assembly? You would have another French Revolution on your hands. Um, so uh, the, the gentleman from Wisconsin uh, said that uh, most of the people in the District of Columbia uh, our federal employees, at least I think I heard him to say that, uh, that is uh, patently false. Most people are not federal employees, and the vast majority of federal employees do not live in Washington, D.C. They live in other parts of the country. And we don't disenfranchise the states, that we don't disenfranchise federal employees wherever they live because they're federal employees. Uh, federal employees, whether they're in the civilian service or the military service, um, are patriotically devoted to serving the people of the country. Why would we think that that is the basis for disenfranchising them? That strikes me as a nonsensical 
uh, proposition. Could, Look, I, could I just ask my, my by, question? By all means. Is, is my friend from Maryland a federal employee? Uh, I am indeed. And do you have the right to vote in Maryland? I do have, I, I've not lost the right to vote because I got elected to Congress. I thank my friend. Yeah. Uh, and uh, look, um, teachers have the right to vote. Firefighters have the right to vote. Cops have the right to vote. People who work for the government, that is who work for the democratic citizenry, enjoy the right to vote. There's a Supreme Court case called Carrington versus Rash, which said that uh, military personnel cannot be disenfranchised by the state of Texas simply because they're in the military. Um, there's a case from, uh, from Maryland actually called Evans versus Kornman, which said that people who live on the NIH complex cannot be disenfranchised because they live on a federal enclave. They, people who work for the government, whether it's local, state, or federal, are free citizens of the United States and shall not be disenfranchised for that reason. So I just think that the rationales and the alibis are fading out quickly. They're shrinking. These, these rationales don't survive in the 21st century. Everybody wants to be able to participate as an equal in American democracy. It's not a just arrangement. And uh, I would be uh, ashamed if I thought that I would come here to try to deny other people their equal right to participate in our democracy. We have the power under Article 1, Section 8, Clause 17. We have the power under Section 5 of the 14th Amendment in Equal Protection. We have ample constitutional powers to admit states. This is the only way it's ever happened. Congress has admitted 37 states since we began. It's never been done by constitutional amendment. There is no constitutional impediment to admitting the land that we would cede to the new state. And every state of admission is different. You know, it was said that Texas could not be admitted because it was an independent republic. That had never been done before. It was unprecedented. It was said Hawaii and Alaska cannot be made part of America because they're not contiguous to the rest of the country. It was objected vociferously that they didn't belong, but they were admitted nonetheless. It was objected that Utah and Idaho were dominated by uh, the Mormon church, and therefore they couldn't be admitted. And that was rejected too. All of these arguments have been rejected historically in the interest of one overriding imperative, democratic equality for everyone who lives in our country. Jefferson said we would not become an empire. We would be a representative democracy by making sure that everybody belongs. Thank you for yielding, and I yield back. The, the gentleman uh, from Arizona, Mr. Gosar, is recognized for five minutes. Thanks, Chairwoman. Um, so it, uh, it comes to me that when we establish this, uh, our, four, our framers actually uh, put this together. There was a much smaller imprint. There was a smaller geographic footprint. And so they wanted it centrally located. Today, we're much different. We're 50 states that go from sea to shining sea. And so it seems to me that there also is undue influence by having the makeup of all the money that goes through Congress uh, and goes through the DC app apparatus. So, so my question is to the gentleman from Virginia. Um, there was a precedent set. So there were two, two states that actually ceded land, Maryland and Virginia. Is that true? But I'm from Maryland. I, I understand. Oh, are you posing the question to me? I'm posing the question. Okay, there's a gentleman from Virginia. I'm sorry. But, okay. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, th there were lands that were offered in 1791, both by the Virginia General Assembly and the Maryland General Assembly. Yeah, and, and they, they knew that there was, that this was being ceded, so no state was going to be constructed. Is that true? I'm sorry. That they, so they, the, both states ceded this land knowing that this would never be a state knowing that the lands would be used by the federal government and for the purposes for, of the seat of government, right, yes. And never as a state. So it seems to me that we also saw the ceding back to Virginia of its lands, did it not? In 1846. Yeah, and so uh, the, the country has gotten much bigger since 19, 1846, right? Correct. You know, like Arizona wasn't even a state, it was a territory up. Correct. So, so it seems to me that if we were going to do this, there was a precedent set, set already that if Maryland wanted its claim to see back, to take that back that land, it should. And number two is that I want equal representation or opportunity to have the commerce that exists in this state 
out west. So I think we ought to have an open opportunity for all states to look at the seat of government. We've seen it change over time in other countries. Ah, but by your argument, Congress would not have the power to do that. I mean, you, you seem to be conceding that Congress could relocate the seat of government, and I agree with that. Congress could relocate the seat of government, and I know several people on your side of the aisle have proposed that. But by your argument, Article 1, Section 8, Clause 17 operates as a straitjacket that freezes the seat of government in one geographic place. And I'm, I'm agreeing with you, that's wrong. It, 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 it's a centralized aspect at that time. And so I would say that I'm in co uh, collaboration with that very thought because the dynamics of this country have changed. So we want to make it more centralized. It seems like that would be more appropriate for like Louisiana, or for you know, somebody central like Kansas or Missouri or something like that. So you do believe that Congress could relocate the seat of government? Oh, I, I think we're seeing it right now in aspects where you're seeing interior bills okay, like moving out to Colorado. To follow your hypothetical, if it were moved to Colorado, would the people who remained here still have to be disenfranchised for eternity? Well, first of all, they're not disenfranchised because the claim goes back to Maryland. Well, but in other words... The, the, but once again... The, the land that was ceded... Okay, the, I think that you're agreeing with the proposition. You don't like the idea that the people here would get their own state, but you're agreeing that they could be given their own state because no, Congress uh, has the power under no, the district no, clause uh, no, to my, modify uh, the My district. point is, it's not that. It is that you cede it back to the state, so all the folks in D.C. would be uh, participating with Maryland, so there's no creation there, and you'd open up the bidding aspect. And I think there's a lot of states out there that would actually cede that land. But that's a they, policy there's proposal. No, there's no, there's yeah. no state aspect to that. Okay, that's a policy proposal. That's not a constitutional stricture. You're saying that you would like it best to go in that direction. No, but I think, it, I think it conforms with Federalist, and it conforms with the application that uh, our framers are, are actually had intended. They don't want the seat of government to have undue influence in regards to the application from a state. And I think that that's consistent with the representative's proposal because it's it not, would not be it is, part. It's actually not because it doesn't reform. I still have my time. I still have my time. So, so once again, now I, I, think, uh, I think the discourse, I think, is very good in this aspect. It doesn't because what it does is it says, okay, if that's what you want, then you go back to, to Maryland. The precedent's already been established with the Virginia. And then let's open up the bidding in regards across the country to allow a central, or that, that part of government, the central aspect of the United States that will actually um, uh, be relocated one way or the other um, based not upon representation of the state, but as an entity un, uh, uh, un, un yielding to a, a state's jurisdiction. So I think it's, it's very uh, opposite of that, that, at that claim. And with that, I yield back. The gentleman's time has expired. Does anyone else seek recognition? Madam Seeing Chair. no one else seeking recognition. Madam Chair. Where? Madam Chair, uh, the, the, the you, nature you've already spoken. That, you've already uh, spoken. Uh, Another member has to yes. yield your time. Mr. Massey. I, Mr. Massey. Mr. Raskin, this is a, a, a genuine question, and I appreciate the dialogue you had with Mr. Gosar. What do you make of the 23rd Amendment to the Constitution? Well, that's a good question. The 23rd Amendment is what gives the people in the seat of government representation in the Electoral College as though they were a state, although no more than the smallest state that's built into the terms of it. Uh, I believe that uh, Congresswoman Norton's legislation uh, effectuates uh, an automatic uh, repeal process of the 23rd Amendment because obviously the people who live in the remaining seat of government, which as I get it would be the mall area, it would be the White House, the Capitol, the Supreme Court, some of the federal buildings, they should not have three electoral college votes, clearly. So it, that would be repealed very quickly, automatically, I think. So you concede that it would have to be repealed through the constitutional process for repealing an amendment before this new territory or could become a state? That's right, be precisely because it was a constitutional amendment. In other words, the residents of the District of Columbia did not get the right to participate in presidential elections automatically with the adoption of the Equal Protection Clause or anything else. There, there needed to be a separate constitutional amendment to give them the right so that would re re be repealed since they would now have their own state. So I, I just want to make it clear for some of the people who are excited here today that this, if it passed, it would be, make a new state without 
the requirement of having a constitutional amendment, but that's not the case. There has to be a constitutional amendment in addition to this bill in order to consummate this new state. Well, I don't think that's quite the structure. I mean, I, I think Congresswoman Norton, in her intellectual honesty, and I'll let her speak for herself, is saying that it would only make sense to repeal the 23rd Amendment because you wouldn't want the residents of the White House and whoever, the, the remaining residents in the mall area, to have three electoral college votes. It just wouldn't make any sense. One, one more question for you, and then I'll yield to Ms. Norton, who I'm sure has an answer. Um, what about the remaining residents? Are they disenfranchised? Well, if you're talking about the president and the president's family, presumably, I think they have a right to vote in the state the president comes from, whether that state is New York or Florida or California but or there, the new state. If there are residents in the federal enclave. There would be a handful, and that's an interesting point you're making, because some people are saying, well, surely the founders understood there would be people in the seat of government, and they thought it would be like a seasonal legislature where people would come and then they would go back to their states. They never imagined it would be, you know, a metropolis of 700,000 or 800,000 people. So I think there would be a handful, and that would be consistent with the constitutional design. Those few dozen people would I'd, figure out I'd another like way to I'd like to yield some time to Ms. Norton. She would like to answer the issue about the 23rd Amendment. On the 23rd Amendment, of course, we'd have to repeal the 23rd Amendment. It's a constitutional amendment. We'd have to go through a constitutional process. We believe that would be the fastest uh, process uh, ever seen because no state would want the district to have six electoral votes instead of three electoral votes. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Norton. I yield the balance of my time to Mr. Higgins. I thank my colleague, Madam Chair. The, the very nature of this, of this healthy and intelligent debate that, that we have witnessed uh, this day so far is, is the reason, the cornerstone upon which I, I respectfully ask Madam Chair uh, to perhaps seek counsel from her parliamentarian and, and, her, and her colleagues in a brief recess and and willingly withdraw this markup this day. We, we have shown, demonstrated by, by, by peaceful but vigorous and passionate, intelligent and well-founded debate that this issue is not settled within the parameters comfortably of the Constitution that we're sworn to serve. I respectfully ask the Chair to consider withdrawing on this day this markup and let us schedule further hearings and hear from constitutional scholars on both sides of this spectrum before we step into unconstitutionalist territory. I yield. I appreciate that many of us have different opinions on this issue, but we will be going forward. We have a number of amendments. Uh, we have uh, others who want to participate in the debate, and uh, the gentleman's time has expired. Um, who else seeks recognition? The gentlelady from the great state of Massachusetts. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Just felt compelled to offer the, the irony in that my colleagues uh, across the aisle often uh, lift up our veterans and the price that they've paid uh, for our country and our democracy. And so if we're going to talk about uh, democracy and the Constitution, um, I, I do want to just highlight that there are something like 79,000 veterans who are being disenfranchised uh, right now. So um, to support that seems to fly in the face of a lot of the espoused values uh, from my colleagues across the aisle. The gentlelady, yield back. Yeah, okay. Now, now the gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Norman, is recognized for five minutes? No, no, no. no. all right. If, if there's no further uh, general debate, I, I now understand that there are a number of amendments. Uh, who seeks recognition with their amendments? Mr. Heiss is recognized for five minutes. Uh, no, 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 right? no, 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 Mr. Does Heiss, have, okay. Does everyone have a copy? We'll, we'll, we'll pause while your, your amendment is distributed. Thank okay. you, Madam Chair. Mm 
you want? Oh, yeah, we can clerk that. Can I clerk that? Yeah. Sure. Um, no problem. Mm -hmm. Have your staff email the clerk mm -hmm. and we'll correct it in a second. Okay. I okay. can't say it anymore. Um, sure. Uh, while we're waiting, okay. while, while we're, we're, we're waiting, the gentlelady would like to correct uh, a number. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. It's uh, actually 29,700 um, uh, veterans who call DC home, again, who have defended democracy around the world, have put their lives on the line, but do not have democracy uh, in their own home. Thank you. I yield. Ms. Presley. Okay. Madam Chair, I have an amendment at the desk. They're still passing, it out. They're, they're still passing your amendment out. Uh, I haven't even gotten it. Oh, here it is. Okay. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment to H.R. 5803 offered by Mr. Heiss of Georgia. Okay. Without objection. The reading of the amendment is dispensed with. The gentleman from Georgia is recognized to explain his amendment. Thank you, Madam Chair. And Th this amendment really is right in the, the epicenter of our discussion today, which is that uh, it's critical that uh, we have a constitutional amendment to proceed with any discussion on D.C. statehood. And so this amendment would require Congress to consider and pass a joint resolution amending the Constitution in order to grant D.C. statehood. Uh, and this is clearly... Uh, our founders clearly crafted the Constitution, as I mentioned earlier, in such a way that the seat of our federal government would not be within a state, much less that it would be a state. And uh, as has been mentioned several times this morning already, James Madison, Federalist Number 43, articulated that if the capital of the United States were situated within a state, the federal government would be subject to undo influence by that host state. And we've heard arguments on the other side uh, that uh, proponents of D.C. statehood believe that uh, excluding a small federal enclave from the territory of a new state would solve this problem, but I don't believe personally that, that uh, it would solve any such problem. The Constitution does not distinguish between the seat of federal government and the district where that government is seated. And so we've got uh, an, uh, an issue here. Roger Pilon, who is a witness in the D.C. statehood hearing, rightfully said, and I quote, although the framers did not set a minimum size for the district, their mention of 10 miles square, together with Congress's nearly contemporaneous creation of the district in 1790 from 10 miles square of land ceded to the federal government by Maryland and Virginia, is strong evidence of what they intended, and strong evidence, too, against this enclave scheme, end quote. Uh, in fact, it, I don't believe it's been mentioned today, but it needs to be that the Ju Justice Department consistently since 1963 has determined that Congress cannot admit D.C. as a state legislatively. The original creation of the district required the consent of the contributing states, so it only makes sense that the district would need consent of other states in order to achieve statehood. So uh, this amendment just says that we need to pass a joint resolution uh, in, uh, for a constitutional amendment in order to pr uh, proceed with this discussion, and I would urge my uh, fellow members to support it. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you. The gentlewoman from the District of Columbia, Ms. Norton, is recognized for five minutes. The gentleman's statement is full of errors. I won't seek to uh, cite them all. The notion of 10 miles square, uh, uh, the notion uh, that the uh, statement must, must be of a certain size uh, has long been uh, understood to mean no greater than, not less than. And we know that from precedent for, because Virginia uh, took back its land and uh, no constitutional amendment or 
uh, anything except legislation uh, was required. Actually, the gentleman wants to change the rules of the state for admitting a state when it comes to the District of Columbia. It is the Constitution that gives Congress, and only Congress, not the Constitution, uh, the authority to admit a state. And every state has been admitted by majority vote. 37 new states have been admitted by majority vote. And a constitutional amendment has never been proposed. Uh, and for those states, uh, the Constitution did not give the same power. It gives the Congress. The Congress has the power, uh, has plenary power over the district. And so the Congress does, right here, have the power uh, to admit this uh, state as every other state uh, has been admitted. So I think the gentleman's. Will the gentleman let you? Um, do I still, if I still have time, I, I will yield. Th thank you. Yeah, I, just to add to the gentlelady's argument here, um, this would set a terrible precedent of having to amend the Constitution to uh, add states to the Union. Uh, it has always been understood to be part of Congress's powers under Article 4 of the Constitution to admit new states. We did not need a constitutional amendment to uh, admit Texas, which was an independent republic. We did not need a constitutional amendment to admit West Virginia, which used to be part of Virginia. We didn't need a constitutional amendment to uh, admit Tennessee, which used to be part of Virginia. And I think it just confuses uh, a very clear legislative power that we already enjoy with the constitutional uh, amendment process. And I, I don't see any reason to do it. Again, um, 80% of federal employees live somewhere else in the United States. The idea that uh, a majority of people who live within the new Washington Douglas Commonwealth are federal employees is wrong. And if it were right, it would not be caused to disenfranchise them and to destroy their representation in Congress in any event. I yield back would to the gentleman. Would the gentleman yield? I'm sorry. It's not my time. I've yielded back to the gentleman. Uh, 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 the, 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 there is no Nothing in the Constitution that says anything about uh, qualifications to be a state. Traditionally, you had to be a democracy. Uh, you had to have sufficient support for statehood in your own population. Uh, and you have to have had the resources. That's the precedent. All have been shown to be the case for the District of Columbia. In fact, we, have a, we had more resources than most of the states uh, had when they entered the Union more than 22 states. I yield back. Yield. Who, who seeks recognition? Uh, uh, is, she, is she yielding? Uh, uh, yes, I, I yield to the gentleman. Thank you. And as much as I know Texas would probably like to be considered, they were not the, the seat of the government. Uh, none of the states that you mentioned were. And that's the difference here. The District of Columbia is the seat of the federal government, specifically designed not to be in a state, nor to be a state. I take, I reclaim my time. As nothing, uh, the seat of government will remain, uh, it will be called the capital. There will be a seat of government. Uh, there's nothing in the Constitution that says the seat of government must be uh, the District of Columbia. It only carves out the 10 miles square as the District of Columbia to say that the seat of government shall not be larger than 10 miles square. Uh, the, uh, the, 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 we have carved out uh, what most Americans think of as the capital. They will come to it, we will call it the capital, and it is less than 10 miles square. I yield back. Okay. The gentlelady's time has expired. Uh, the chair recognizes herself for five minutes. I oppose this amendment, and I want to point out that all 37 new states have been admitted by Congress, not by a constitutional amendment. As Mr. Raskin has so eloquently pointed out, there is nothing in the Constitution that prohibits Congress from admitting the state of Washington, D.C., including the Admissions Clause, the District Clause, the 23rd Amendment, or the Guarantee Clause. By offering this amendment, Mr. Heisa perhaps is acknowledging that D.C. deserves to be a state 
and it deserves statehood. He just has a different view than we do on the legal mechanism necessary to achieve it. But we're, we've consulted with constitutional scholars, and their unanimous opinion is that Congress can't admit a state, just like it has 37 times before. I see no reason why we should treat D.C. differently than every other new state that has been admitted by Congress. So I believe this amendment is not necessary, so I urge my colleagues to oppose this amendment, and I yield back. Well, well, Wait a will, minute. Will the gentlelady yield just for? I, I will. <laughs> I, my, I, I grant my remaining time to Mr. Raskin. Thank you. I just wanted to make one quick point. I received a correction. I had been saying that um, more than 80 percent of federal workers in the United States live outside of Washington, D.C. The correct number is 93 percent. So. Uh, more than nine out of ten federal workers do not live in the land where the people are asking for statehood. On what basis would we deny them statehood? Um, so, I, you know, Madam Chair, I just want to say that each of the arguments that has been offered, I think often in, uh, or always in very good faith, uh, has been falling away as we look at the actual facts of the situation. Uh, the District of Columbia, uh, is a place where a majority of the people are not federal workers and the vast majority of federal workers live somewhere else. I yield back to the chair. Okay. Hearing no further discussion, the question now occurs on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Georgia. All those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed say no. 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 In the opinion of the chair, the noes Ask have it, and the amendment vote. is not adopted. Ask for a recorded vote, please. A recorded vote has been requested. A recorded vote is so ordered and pursuant to Clause 2 of Rule 11 and Committee Rule 6D, proceedings on the amendment are postponed. And is there any further amendment discussion? Madam Chair, I have another amendment at the desk. Okay. The gentleman has an amendment at the desk. The clerk will uh, distribute. Okay. We'll pause while the amendment's distributed. Does, does everyone have a copy of the amendment? Okay, the clerk will report the amendment. Amendment to H.R. 5803 offered by Mr. Heiss of Georgia. Without objection. The, and uh, the reading of the, the amendment is dispensed with and the gentleman is recognized to explain his amendment. Thank you, Madam Chair. In its current form, H.R. 5803 immediately transforms current elected officials, city officials, into state officials uh, if D.C. were to become a state. So in this case, the current mayor would become the governor, and the current city council would be transformed into members of the legislature. And I think this is uh, alarming. I, I, elections, as we all know, and we have all personally experienced, elections are at the root of our democracy, and they help to promote a legitimate uh, democratic voice uh, of the people to be heard. And so to ensure that the state government, if D.C. were to become a state, that it remains legitimate and responsive to the people that it serves, there needs to be new elections that are held. 
An elected official is elected to the position for which they ran, not to a different position uh, and to another uh, position in government. So the, the current mayor of D.C. Uh, is not the governor and if D.C. were to become a state. And uh, anywhere else, if there is a mayor, let me put it this way, in any other city in this country, if a mayor wants to become the governor, they must run and be elected to be the governor. And, uh, and that would apply to state legislatures as well. And so this amendment uh, simply is an attempt to try to address uh, and to protect the uh, democratic roots of our country and uh, to require that elections be held uh, for the various uh, state positions if D.C. were to be a state in and of itself. So again, I thank uh, you, Madam Chair, and I would urge support for this amendment. I yield back. I yield to the representative from the District of Columbia, the gentlewoman, Ms. Norton, for five minutes. Uh, Madam Chair, there is no constitutional requirement, or for that matter, guidance, on what happens to the elected officials of the territory uh, when they become state, but there certainly is no requirement in the Constitution uh, re regarding that matter. Uh, so we must look to what has been the common practice for the 37 states that have been admitted in the same way the District of Columbia seeks to be admit admitted. The common practice has been that the elected officials of the then territories continue in office in the equivalent state position upon admission. We see no reason for that practice, which has been the case throughout uh, our uh, Constitution, should be changed for the District of Columbia. And there certainly is no constitutional requirement regarding elect elected officials. So I urge uh, that we uh, decline to approve the gentleman's amendment. Is there any further debate on, on this amendment? Hearing no further discussion, the question now occurs on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Georgia. All those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed say no. Yeah. No. In the opinion of the chair, the noes have it, and the amendment is not adopted. Ask for a recorded vote, please, ma'am. A recorded vote has been requested. A recorded vote is so ordered. And pursuant to Clause 2 of Rule 11 and Committee Rule 6D, proceedings on the amendment are postponed. Is there further talk? Madam Chairwoman. Okay. For what? Ms. Miller. Ms. Miller, for what purpose does the gentlelady seek recognition? I have an amendment at the desk. We will pause while the amendment is distributed. Has everyone received a copy of the amendment? No, not yet. Okay, does everyone have a copy? Okay, the court will report the amendment. Amendment to H.R. 5803 offered by Ms. Miller from West Virginia. Without objection, the reading of the amendment is dispensed with, and the gentleman is recognized to explain his amendment. Her, her. her amendment. Her amendment. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chairwoman Maloney. Abortion in Washington, D.C. has long been a contested issue in Congress. What should be undisputed, however, is the care of a child who is born alive after an attempted abortion. Unfortunately, as evidenced by Virginia Governor Ralph Northam's comments last year, not all members believe that a child born alive should be protected. Governor Northam stated the infant would be delivered. 
the infant would be kept comfortable. The infant would be resuscitated if that's what the mother and the family desired. And then a discussion would ensue between the physician and the mother. This blatant disregard for human life cannot be tolerated. This amendment- will, will the woman suspend, gentlelady suspend? Because there is the, the amendment you're talking about is not the one that was offered, that was handed out. Okay, this one is handed out. Yeah. 5803. Is no, no, no. It's, it's about employment. Which deals with employment. The amendment that was passed out is not on abortion. Oh. Where? Well, they were handed me a different one. Can, can you get me the right <laughs> amendment, please? <laughs> this is on employment. Can, can please, we please, will the clerk distribute the correct amendment? Okay. <laughs> That would be helpful. I mean, this, this is on employment. <laughs> okay. The gentleman, the lady may resume. Now, now, has everyone gotten the correct? No, no we'll, we'll, let, we'll let people okay. get the correct amendment. Let's let them get the correct amendment. Mm -hmm. Thanks. <laughs> if every amendment, does everyone have the amendment? Related to abortion. Related to abortion, the correct amendment. Okay. Everyone needs to literally be on the same page. Does everyone have the abortion amendment? Okay, the, the gentlelady is recognized. Mm -hmm. Do you want me to start over? Yes, yes. Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Chairwoman Maloney. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Abortion in Washington, D.C. has long been a contested issue in Congress. What should be undisputed, however, is the care of a child who is born alive after an attempted abortion. Unfortunately, as evidenced by Virginia Governor Ralph Northam's comments last year, not all members believe that a child born alive should be protected. Governor Northam stated, the infant would be delivered. The infant would be kept comfortable. The infant would be resuscitated if that's what the mother and the family desired. And then a discussion would ensue between the physician and the mother. This blatant disregard for human life cannot be tolerated. This amendment would require healthcare practitioners to give the same level of care to a child born alive after an attempted abortion as a child at the same gestational age. It would also require the immediate transfer of the surviving infant to a hospital. Finally, it would require that healthcare practitioners or other employees report any violations of this provision to law enforcement for criminal prosecution. Our most vulnerable and youngest citizens deserve the utmost protection under the law. I urge members to support this amendment and protect the lives of those infants who are born alive. Finally, it would require the healthcare practitioners or other employees report any violations of this provision to law enforcement for criminal protection. I repeat. Madam Chair. Hey, the gentlelady from the District of Columbia is recognized, Ms. Eleanor Holmes Norton. Well, this is certainly unprecedented. The gentlelady wants to legislate for the new state before it is a state uh, to impose conditions on the state of Washington, D.C. Uh, the whole point of this process is to give the new state the right to decide its own laws. What the gentlelady is doing is the kind of amendment that the Republicans every single year uh, place into 
the DC appropriation bill. It is precisely to get away from that process that the statehood bill is uh, before you today. You could not do what you do in the appropriation state, forbid the district from spending its own local funds on abortion for poor women, if it were a state. Uh, and you cannot do it as a prerequisite to become a state. The, the equal footing doctrine prohibits Congress from imposing conditions on new states, including laws that you would like the new state to enact. You, could, you should then run for office in the new state or petition the new state. I yield back. Madam Chair. The, the distinguished ranking member is recognized for five minutes. I, I would just want to support the gentlelady's amendment, um, uh, the gentlelady from West Virginia's amendment. There are some things that are so darn important, you want to do everything you can to protect them. And we're talking about the sanctity of life. In this situation, we're talking about the sanctity of life of a child who's already born. Um, and we, as the gentlelady pointed out, the, the, the comments from a current governor of the state of Virginia are the reason that she is offering this important amendment to this legislation in the event that it becomes a state. This, 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 is, this is just fundamental. This is common sense. This is so basic. That's all this amendment is. And I appreciate the, uh, the gentlelady from West Virginia uh, bringing this amendment forward and urge the adoption of it. I yield back. Uh, is there any further debate on the amendment? The gentlelady from uh, the great California, Katie Porter. I want to speak in opposition to this amendment. This is certainly a debate that my colleagues on the other side are free to continue to make on the House floor, as they do virtually every single week. Um, but this, this amendment, as the arguments that they make each week on the floor, um, are both medically inaccurate, are unconstitutional and are an attempt to infringe on the right of women to receive health care. This amendment is nothing more than an attempt to use women's health care and the freedom of each person to make their own choice about health care as a political football in this debate on DC statehood. I also want to um, echo the comments of my colleague um, from the District of Columbia that the equal footing doctrine of the Constitution clearly prohibits this kind of amendment. Um, Ms. Miller is free to continue to offer this kind of amendment on the floor of the House that would be applicable to every state, and I will continue to oppose this kind of amendment. But that is where this debate belongs. It does not belong, this amendment and this discussion does not belong in a discussion about the D.C. statehood issue. People in D.C. have this, should have, that's what we're here for today, should have the same constitutional rights to women's health care as people in every single other part of this nation. With that, I yield back. Is there any other debate on this uh, amendment? May I say one more thing? Uh, well, if someone would grant you time. I, I Mr. Yield. Heiss is recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Our most vulnerable and youngest citizens deserve the utmost protection under the law. Should D.C. ever become a state, they should have to institute these protections as well. I yield back. Okay. Hearing no further discussion, the question now occurs on the amendment offered by the gentlewoman from West Virginia. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say no. no, no. In the opinion of the chair, the noes have it and the amendment is not adopted. Madam Chair, I request a recorded vote. A, rec a recorded vote has been uh, requested and a recorded vote is so ordered and pursuant to clause two of rule 11 and committee rule 6D, proceedings on the amendment are postponed. Madam Chairwoman. Who seeks recognition? I do. Okay. I have an amendment at the desk. Okay. Okay. Uh, we will pause while the amendment, hopefully the correct amendment, is distributed. Is is uh, my friend from West Virginia? Is it the employment one? No.
this is now firearm. What? Pardon me? What did you say? What did you say, Eleanor? Uh, uh, he says this is firearm. Yeah, okay, yes. okay. Okay. Does everyone have the amendment? The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment to H.R. 5803 offered by Ms. Miller of West Virginia. Without objection, the reading of the amendment is dispensed with. The gentlelady is recognized to explain her amendment. Thank you, Chairwoman Maloney and Ranking Chairman Jordan. My amendment today is an important amendment because it helps preserve the constitutional rights of all Americans. The gun laws in the District of Columbia historically are currently among the most restrictive in the United States. These laws prohibit individuals from exercising their constitutional right to carry a firearm. In 2019, the district saw the most murders committed since 2008, and robberies have increased 10% as in compared to the previous year. It was not until 2008 that the Supreme Court decided in the District of Columbia versus Heller that private citizens would have the right to keep and bear arms for self-defense in their own homes. We must repeal the current laws in the district and allow Congress to enact gun legislation that affords citizens the right to protect themselves. I urge my colleagues to support this common sense amendment and I yield back. Is there further debate on the amendment? Uh, uh, Ma Ma <clears throat> Madam Chair. I recognize uh, Eleanor Holmes Norton now, from the District of Columbia. This time, uh, the gentlelady tries to impose uh, conditions on the reduced federal district. Uh, bear in mind, and this is the response, that the status quo will remain on the laws of the federal district. Uh, the, the laws of the District of Columbia that are in effect when this bill is passed would apply in the reduced federal district in the same manner in, as they do uh, today. But Congress will have plenary authority at that point, meaning sole authority over the reduced federal district because the Congress will be the rightful legislature for the reduced federal district. This bill is not the appropriate vehicle for the reduced federal district. The member will have to wait until there is a reduced federal district to speak to that question. Uh, as, as, we, as it stands now, as the gentle lady knows, uh, the there are amendments on the D.C. appropriation of the kind she fears to be for. I will, yield will the gentlelady yield? Uh, I, I, yield to, I yield to my friend from Maryland. Thank you very much. Um, we, we appear to be off on an interesting tangent right now, Madam Chair. Um, you know, in the audience, we have dozens and dozens of people who've come from Washington, D.C., to petition government for a redress of grievances and to seek approval of their petition for admission to the union as a new state. They are asking for their full democratic rights. If you don't want to help them, don't help them. I think as an American citizen, I know that I would not feel I'm doing my duty. I would not be fulfilling my constitutional oath if I did not hear them seriously in what they're asking for. But Please do not use their drive for statehood as an opportunity to finger paint and scrawl graffiti all over their state constitution with your pet political agendas. Um, the equal footing doctrine establishes that every state must be admitted on equal grounds. This means that the new state of Washington Douglas County has every right to develop their own state constitution that California or Ohio or Michigan or Florida or South Carolina has. And we don't need to micromanage and superintend their struggle for democracy. 
And so uh, I find this an affront to the whole process that we would try to impose upon them something we're not trying to impose on everybody else. If you want to impose your anti-choice agenda on the people of New Columbia, then you should go out and try to amend every state constitution in America along those lines. You should try to override the state firearms uh, regulations in every state in America if that's really what you want to do. Now, let me say something about the Second Amendment, because the framers of the Constitution... Uh, will the gentleman yield, will, yes, yield back for, of course. for a moment? Uh, no, what the gentlelady wants to do is to impose uh, an amendment on not the District of Columbia, but on the federal district. And the, the gentlelady will have the authority to do that in, as she, when, there be, when, when this bill is passed and there is a federal district. We, ob we object to their, their, their imposing that on the District of Columbia or on the new state. It is the federal district. She is premature. You will have the opportunity to impose your amendment on the federal district when the district becomes a state and there is a federal district. Who else seeks Madam recognition? Chair. Madam Chair. The ranking member is recognized. Graffiti? Protecting unborn children? The gentleman just called that graffiti? Is this the amendment? We talked about her, her previous amendment was about a child already born. And the member is talking about graffiti? These are the, the Second Amendment, the second, right next to the first for a reason. And, he, and, and the gentleman is calling that graffiti. This is about fundamental liberties that the gentlelady is bringing her amendments forward. And the gentleman from Maryland is saying, oh, this is graffiti. This is not not the proper venue to stand up for the rights and, the, and, and sanctity of human life. That, that is ridiculous. That's all, that's all these amendments are. If you, if you want to vote against them, vote against them. But to say she can't even offer them and, and to refer to this as graffiti and somehow, that is ridiculous. We're talking about protecting the sanctity of human life. Life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. The document that started this grand experiment we call America, the very first thing they mentioned is the sanctity of life. That's what the gentlelady from... West Virginia is seeking to, to protect, and of course that important Second Amendment, I mean, that, 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 that just, that is so wrong. Well, if, you, if you want to vote against our amendments, vote against our amendments. Don't, don't say she shouldn't offer them, it's particularly when there is as fundamental as protecting human life and protecting the Second Amendment to the Constitution, those are pretty darn important. And to refer to him as graffiti is just plain ridiculous. I yield back. Is there any further debate on the amendment? Who seeks recognition? The gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Conley. I thank the chairwoman. If there's a fundamental right embedded in the Constitution, it is the right of self-determination. The whole point of the revolution the whole point of the Declaration of Independence and the whole point of the Constitution was self-determination. We were separating ourselves from a monarchy. We were no longer going to be a colony. We weren't going to be kept by anybody. We were going to express ourselves in our laws, in our norms, and creating our institutions. And that's what Mr. Raskin was referring to. You can try to put words in his mouth. The gentleman you? I'm, I'm going to finish. I think he used You've had plenty graffiti. of time. I think he used Mr. the word Rank, graffiti. Madam Chairwoman, this is my time. Gentleman well, when I get time. accused of putting words in Ma someone's Madam mouth Chairwoman, and use the exact Madam Chairwoman, words they Madam Chairwoman, he's use. out of order. The gentleman is not recognized. The gentleman has the time. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Mr. Raskin wasn't questioning the right of a member of this committee to offer an amendment. He was questioning the appropriateness of it in circumscribing a local government, hopefully soon to be a state government. I ran one of the largest local governments in the United States for 14 years, five as chairman. I would never welcome Congress telling me about my land use decisions or my zoning variances or building heights, or gun laws. Those were my affairs, and Congress knew it could not and would not 
assert itself with respect to my local government or any other local government in Ohio, Virginia, Maryland, except with respect to DC. We constantly have a pattern of inserting ourselves in the affairs of DC, taking away their right of self-determination, whether you agree with it or not. And that's really what these amendments are all about. We heard earlier that really what this boiled down to was a matter of a constitutional necessity before we could grant voting representation to the District of Columbia. We now see that's really not true. What this is really all about is control. Control over 700,000 fellow Americans, control over their destiny, control in blocking their ability to determine their own affairs, even if we dissent, even if we disagree. And that's what these amendments, all of them, are really about. Congress asserting itself in the local affairs of a city that ought to be able to determine its own destiny, its own future, its own issues. So I will oppose this amendment and presumably others of similar nature on the basis that they compromise the ability of a jurisdiction to determine its own future and its own resolution of challenging issues. That's their right as Americans. And I am going to exercise my right to vote against it. And I thank with, the with, with gentleman, yeah. I will. Uh, I want to thank the gentleman from Virginia for his uh, uh, astute remarks. I was not, of course, challenging in any way the gentlelady from West Virginia's right to introduce this amendment or any of the others. What I'm saying is that in the history of constitutional uh, politics and in the history of statehood admissions, we don't try to impose on the people of other states our own policy preferences. So. Uh, I, I, I take it that the gentlelady uh, identifies with uh, what I would call an anti-choice or a pro-life position. I believe in a pro-choice politics. I would not try to amend the state constitution of West Virginia to say that uh, it must embody Roe versus Wade and the right of woman to choose in consultation with her physician and her family and conscience. I would not try to dictate to another state what their, poli their health care politics are going to be, and yet you want to use the opportunity of these people seeking basic democratic rights, representation in Congress, uh, not to support them. I don't think that the gentlelady is saying she'll support it, but she's saying nonetheless she wants to try to strip from them the right to have control over their own health care politics and their own firearm regulation. So it's just adding insult to injury. Now, if, the, if I'm wrong and the general lady is going to support statehood admission, maybe that's a different conversation. And if she thinks she's speaking for a lot of people in the new state, that might be a different suggestion. But I would, I would welcome the opportunity to hear about that, if that's right. I yield back my time. Uh, uh, who seeks gentlemen? If recognition, the gentleman. Uh, Mr. Massey is recognized. Thank you. I'm, I'm glad to hear that Mr. Raskin supports repealing the Affordable Care Act. <coughs> Um, otherwise known as Obamacare, because he just said that he would never want the federal government to impose uh, its health care politics on the states. And uh, with that... Well, would the gentleman yield? I would yield. Yeah. I, I said I would never dictate to the people of West Virginia what is going to be in their state constitution. With respect to federal law and the spending of federal money, I will do everything in my power to support women's right to choose and the full panoply of health care options. I, well, I thought I heard the gentleman say health care politics and not constitution. And uh, that's what Obamacare seeks to do, is to control not just federal money, but individuals' monies, corporations' monies, at the state level on something that should be a state issue. But I'm, and if the gentleman has anything else to say, I'll Well, but I, I read it completely differently. We, uh, the Affordable Care Act is federal legislation, and we, through the spending power, can control federal legislation and federal rules to vindicate the health care interests of the people, and we're doing that. But I would not try to uh, rewrite the Constitution of West Virginia, and I think that that's the whole intent of these amendments, which is to say, well, we're not going to support your admission as a state, but if it happens, we're like going to try to micromanage your position yeah. on different policies. 
Well, it's, it's imposing policy, not, uh, not with federal money or not related to federal money, but with private money. It's talking about what private people can do in contracts and contracting with health care and setting laws on that. So anyways, I was just glad I saw a glimmer of uh, states' rights and federalism there from the other side of the aisle. And I'm going to yield back the balance of my time so we can offer other amendments. Hearing uh, no further uh, discussion or other, amendment, other discussion on this, uh, the question now occurs on the amendment offered by the gentlewoman from West Virginia. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, no. 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 In the opinion of the chair, the noes have it. Madam Chair, I request a recorded vote. Okay, a, a recorded vote has been requested. A recorded vote is so ordered and pursuant to Clause 2 of Rule 11 and Committee Rule 6D, proceedings on the amendment are postponed. Is there further amendments for discussion? Madam Chairwoman, I have an amendment at the desk. Uh, 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 the gentleman will be, we will pause, the gentleman is recognized, and we will pause while the amendment is handed out and distributed. Does everyone have the amendment? Has it been distributed? Okay, the clerk will report the amendment. Amendment to H.R. 5803 offered by Mr. Massey of Kentucky. Without objection, the reading of the amendment is dispensed with. The uh, I'd, I'd gentleman like is recognized to explain his amendment. Thank you. I'll, I'll just read it very quickly uh, because I think it's such common sense. I think when I read this amendment, everybody in the room is going to agree with it. I, it's a bipartisan, uh, it's offered in a bipartisan fashion, common sense, I think. So let me just read it. Um, inclusion of contiguous federal properties. This has to do with the federal enclave. Notwithstanding any provision of this section upon the admission of the state into the union, the capital shall be considered to include any property of the federal government which is contiguous to the boundaries of the capital. In other words, if you take a look at the map here that's been distributed, there's, there's been a, a federal enclave that's been designated as a consequence of the uh, majority's amendment today. And wh what we noticed here is that not all the federal buildings are included. And two of the federal buildings that were left out of the federal enclave are the post office. In fact, it's, the, the line had to be gerrymandered on Pennsylvania Avenue to put the post office into the new state, yet it's part of the GSA portfolio. So we'll talk about that in a little bit. But also, uh, conspicuously, conspicuously absent from these boundaries is a building that's owned by the GSA and used by the FBI, which is part of the DOJ. So we've got part of the DOJ in the, in the enclave and part of the DOJ outside of the enclave. So what my amendment would do is it would say, let's quit messing around, let's quit gerrymandering this federal enclave and anything that's a federal building that touches the federal enclave, I'm not talking about an island, some building out in Georgetown or something, I'm talking about stuff that's right here next to the Capitol, touches this map, put it in the boundary, and that would include at least two buildings. Now, why, why was the post office left out of this map? Well, maybe somebody from the other side can explain it to me, but I think it's just another jab at Donald Trump. Let me, let me quote the Honorable Phil Mendelson, Chairman of the Council of the District of Columbia. Mr. Jordan questioned him at a hearing about why the post office was not included in the federal enclave. Mr. This was on September 19th, 2019, Mr. Mendelson says, Mendelson, well, the old post office is a hotel, so it's a commercial enterprise, Mr. Jordan says. So it is literally because you wanted the money, you wanted the revenue. Mr. Mendelson said, that's kind of a crass way to put it, but yes. So this is about the new state wants to control 
this enterprise, the Trump Hotel, because they know it's such a great enterprise. I mean, it's, it's generating tax revenue. It's, it's promoting commerce. It's such a wonderful use of this building that the state wants it. They don't want to leave it behind in the enclave. So, um, you know, it's just, in my opinion, this boundary was drawn as a jab at Donald Trump, but also in recognition of his success in converting that building into a revenue generating, not a revenue depleting, but a revenue generating enterprise. And they want it in the new state. And that is why I offer this amendment, not as an exception to the rule, but to get rid of the exceptions to the rule that the Democrats have stuck in here, they basically have gerrymandered this new federal enclave, and I'm saying ungerrymander it. And, and uh, would my friend yield? I would yield. Just for a question. So, if we were to adopt the gentleman's amendment, he would then be prepared to support the underlying bill as amended. Right. Well, you're going to have to have a constitutional amendment. Oh. Uh, so I think that oh. I, I think there's a little problem there. I, I think I am just seeking. I thank my to, friend for clarifying. Yeah, I'm just reclaiming my time. I'm seeking to improve your bill, which I don't necessarily support, but also just to try and algorithmically, you know, instead of human beings coming in saying, "Oh, we want this hotel, we want the tax revenue," instead of doing that, mm -hmm. let's just say everything that's contiguous, all the federal buildings. Are there any uh, questions? Yes, Mr. Rask. Oh, I was just going to ask to be recognized. Okay. The, well, okay. I'll give you I, I, I seconds. first recognize the gentlewoman well, from, I, from the District of uh, Columbia. I'll, okay, I can ask wait, you a wait, question. I haven't yielded back yet, but I will yield back. Thank you. The gentlewoman from the District of, of Columbia is recognized. Eleanor okay. Holmes Martin. Uh, the gentleman's concerned about the Trump Hotel is interesting to me, because that's what this amendment is all about. Even though the President is trying to sell that hotel, uh, as I speak. So what this amendment does is to show that the other side uh, cares more about the Trump Hotel in D.C. than they do about the 700,000 or more vo voters who do not have statehood. They're concerned that the hotel would not be in the reduced federal district. Uh, now, that's not the only hotel, federal hotel, not in the reduced federal district. The Monaco Hotel. Nobody was trying to refer to the Trump Hotel, but he probably doesn't care anymore because he's trying to sell it anyway. Uh, this matter, this, uh, this attempt to protect the soon-to-be-sold Trump Hotel should fail on the merits. Would the general lady yield just for a second? Uh, yes, I, I will yield. Um, the amendment doesn't mention the Trump Hotel specifically, so we can also include the FBI building in the federal enclave, which is owned by the federal government. Uh, the, if the gentleman would reclaim my time, uh, there are federal buildings and federal offices <clears throat> in every state, and so we do not attempt uh, to uh, put federal bill to keep states. Uh, from having federal offices there, so there will be federal offices in this new state. Uh, will the gentleman yield? Who seeks oh. recognition? Okay. Oh. I, I seek recognition. Okay, I, I recognize uh, the gentleman from Maryland. Th thank you very much, and I, I admire the gentleman's courage in introducing this uh, Trump Hotel amendment uh, on the bill. I don't know why he regards the uh, political aspirations of 700,000 Washingtonians as a jab at Donald Trump, uh, nor should it be surprising to anyone that the new state would want to include all revenue producing property in the new state. Certainly, uh, all states are trying to include as much business as possible, but uh, one can only regard with amazement the indignation with which uh, our minority colleagues treat the idea that Donald Trump should actually pay taxes on anything. Uh, that, that's quite a remarkable statement. Um, now, we know that the president has never released his taxes, so we don't know whether he's paid any taxes, and I, I can see that people are fearful that he might be forced to pay taxes uh, on the Trump Hotel at some point. But look at, you know, you, you should check out uh, the writings of the anti-federalists, because I think some of my GOP colleagues would like those. 
they were very suspicious of the seat of government clause because they said what would happen is, is that the president and other mighty federal officials would use the seat of government as their own playground, and it would become a land of corruption and intrigue. And what do you know? You look at the Trump Hotel, there's a provision in the lease which says that no official in the District of Columbia or the United States government can profit from it in any way. Originally, before the Trump uh, administration took over, the GSA said that anybody elected president could not have an interest in the lease from the federal government, and the GSA, under President Trump's new management, changed its position on that and said there's no problem with President Trump and his business profiting in millions of dollars directly from the lease. And that's just the contractual violation. The constitutional violation is, is known to the world at this point, that we've had lots of foreign governments going and patronizing the Trump Hotel, Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, the Philippines, you name it. Every despot and tin pot dictator, kleptocrat on earth goes and uh, pays obeisance to President Trump by spending money at the Trump Hotel. It would be a good thing if we had some real rule of law and this was part of a state, like other hotels, like in my state, that have to obey the law, With the gentleman, like yeah. Marriott and Hilton and so on. Yes, by all means. When, when you talked about every despot and tin pot dictator, I thought you were talking about the United Nations there for a second. Well, that certainly Donald Trump's friends at the United Nations, absolutely I am, like the homicidal crown prince of Saudi Arabia, who assassinated and dismembered a Washington Post journalist and then had his remains chemically uh, dissipated. So this administration is in violation of the Foreign Emoluments Clause, the Domestic Emoluments Clause, and it's in violation of the lease itself. So it would be great to bring some law and order to the management of that property. I yield back, Madam Chair. Uh, Madam Chair. Who else uh, seeks recognition? Madam Chair, just, just wrote. Mm -hmm. oh, I'm sorry. I recognize Mr. Heiss. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, it's amazing to me how some of my friends on the other side are diverting away from the issue, but I am thoroughly enjoying this debate, and I'd like to yield my time to the gentleman from Kentucky. Well, thank you, Mr. Heiss. Clearly, I should have objected to suspending the reading of my amendment because I think some folks on the other side of the aisle haven't read the amendment, so I'm going to read it again. It says, inclusion of contiguous federal properties, notwithstanding any other provision of this section upon admission of the state into the union, the capital shall be considered to include any property of the federal government which is contiguous to the boundaries of the capital. This is not a Trump amendment. This is to undo the gerrymandering and to say we're going to have an algorithm, a rule for how we describe the boundaries of this. But if, but if you really want to know the motivation of the gerrymandering of this map, all we have to do is listen to the chairman of the D.C. Council who said, well, the old post office is a hotel, so it's a commercial enterprise. Mr. Jordan said, so it's literally because you wanted the money, you wanted the revenue. Mr. Mendelson said, that's kind of a crass way to put it, but yes. So all the amendment does, and I'll, I'll just keep reading it if I have to, is it says that federal buildings that touch the federal enclave belong in the federal enclave. Is that, that doesn't seem like such a controversial thing to me. So uh, with that, I yield back to Mr. Heiss. Thank you, and I would like to yield uh, to the ranking member. Well, yeah, I would just add, this is, uh, th th I thank the gentleman for you. Th this is so common sense. You're going right down Pennsylvania Avenue, and you won't go on the north side and bring in the FBI building, but you will go to on the south side and make sure that the Trump Tower gets into the, the new state. I mean, you guys can't even do D.C. statehood without something dealing with, with President Trump. That's all the amendment says. You can have all the arguments about who stays at the Trump Hotel. That, 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 that doesn't mean anything. The point is, you're going right down Pennsylvania Avenue. We're not going to include part of the Justice Department in the enclave. Uh, We'll leave that, in this, but we're going to make sure we do this carve out and make sure the Trump Hotel does go in the new state. Okay, well, if that's how you want to do it. All he's saying, let's have some, at least some little common sense to the gerrymandering that has obviously taken place with anyone who has common sense and looks at the map. I, I support the gentleman's amendment. Who seeks recognition? The gentleman up. Madam, the I, I yield back. Virginia. Mm -hmm. I thank the chairwoman. I just simply want to point out it was the gentleman from Kentucky who brought up Trump. Um, he was the one who said, I think this map is a jab at Trump. Um, he introduced that concept, not this side. It is. Um, and again, I have the floor. Um, and again, 
and I give Mr. Massey a lot of credit, he's an honest man. When asked, well, if we adopt this amendment, will you then vote for statehood with this perfected bill? And of course, his answer was no. So, so we have a series of amendments that are clearly designed to damage the underlying bill or to preempt it as dilatory tactics to prevent us from moving forward. And uh, I guess we're afraid of the vote. We're afraid to have a vote on this bill. We're afraid to give the vote to 700,000 fellow Americans. Um, I don't know what we're afraid of, but uh, I wish these amendments were in fact designed to perfect the bill. And I give my friend from Kentucky credit. He has freely admitted that's not the intent. And uh, it, the intent is to uh, try to derail the with, underlying with bill. The with the gentleman yield. Uh, and I'd be glad to yield to my friend from Maryland. Um, is it fair to say that the people of Washington want the monuments in the federal district and they want the emoluments in the new state? Would the gentleman yield? I think that's probably fine. Yes, uh, I would yield. I would just make the point there's, there's nothing wrong with trying to make a bill we disagree with a little less disagreeable. That's what we're trying, that's what Mr. Massey's amendment's about. So that, that, that happens all the time in the legislative process. We may not agree with the bill. There may be no way that we will ever agree with the bill, but there's nothing wrong with trying to make it a little less disagreeable. Uh, you, uh, reclaiming my time, the gentleman certainly makes a fair point. I simply want everybody watching and everyone in the audience to be reminded of the fact, though, the point of these amendments is not, in fact, to make a better bill that they can then vote for. It is simply I to throw obstructions in the way would, of our being would, able to. Gentlemen, yield. I, I will not at this moment yield. I want to finish my sentence. It is designed to obstruct our ability to mark up this underlying bill and to prevent a clear vote on the right of the citizens of DC to have representation, voting representation, as a state in the United States Congress. I yield back. Uh, does anyone else seek uh, recognition? The gentlelady from the Virgin Islands. It, it seems to me it's really interesting, this discussion that's just going back and forth, that what the District of Columbia is doing is trying to be part of the American experience and actually make money as a state. The Trump Hotel is a hotel, and so they're able to be capitalists, which I would expect my colleagues on the other side of the aisle would appreciate that the District of Columbia wants to be able to get revenues and to get taxes from a hotel, and the same reason that they've kept the FBI headquarters within the state, because it appears that that may be going to development and there may be taxes that come from that. Not keeping the Justice Department is because they're not gonna make any taxes off of the Justice Department or off of the monuments, but a hotel, whoever the hell's name is on it, is going to bring them some tax revenues, which will allow them to not have to come to this body begging for money like the rest of us have to do that don't, are not a state. And by putting some of these amendments in here, I, I, I don't know what, it's, this becomes a different, a quasi-state by some of these amendments that you want. Um, en enacting abortion laws that are not in any state, having, uh, putting hotels that could bring revenues outside of a state so that we not really have a true state that if this bill with these amendments would come into place, this is kind of a semi-state. Uh, that we would have so that the District of Columbia would still be having to come to this body for support and for, or for, for money at some point in time. I, I think that this is ridiculous that we're not allowing them to keep those things that are revenue builders for the state, that allow them to have the kind of income that they need to sustain the people of the District of Columbia when it is a state. This is, this is ludicrous and it's not to make it more onerous, it's to make it less of a state that you're putting these amendments in. Does anyone else seek recognition? Mr. Armstrong is recognized. Madam Chair, I move to strike the last word, and I yield time to my friend from Kentucky. Thank you, Mr. Armstrong. I, I would like to ask the lady from the Virgin Islands if she would indulge me. Are you for or against including the FBI building in the federal enclave? Would you, do you think it should be in the federal enclave or the state? 
I think that we should have it as part of whatever the District of Columbia thinks meets their needs and when they're a state. That it should not be us that's telling them what they should do, but allow them to determine from their own studies and their own but, um, what, what is best for them. But the map, the map is drawn. That's what we're doing. Is the, we're the map is drawn by them, and I'm accepting what they decide is best for them as a state, not what so, we decide who don't live here and who don't have a, 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 are not going to be the ones that are having our children raised in this place. Thank you. Reclaiming my time, it just You're welcome. seems to me, since we are the ones voting on this right now, mm -hmm. and it's our job to maintain a federal enclave, even if there is a state, that we should do the common sense thing and include the FBI building, which is part of the DOJ, which touches the federal enclave. We should include that in the federal enclave. There's no reason to take a federal building that's owned by the federal government, that's used by the federal government, and stick it in a different state if that federal building touches. I mean, if we start doing that, you can go down Pennsylvania Ave and start picking them off and saying, well, the museums generate revenue. Let's, you know, there's a gift shop there. Let's stick that in the state. They'd like to have that revenue. It, it, this is just a common sense amendment. And uh, I, I wish the gentleman from Virginia were still here. He said it's an obstructionist move. It's actually, there's nothing obstructionist about it. I guarantee you there are people on the other side of the aisle who would agree with me that the FBI building, which is part of the DOJ, belongs in the federal enclave. Mr. Massey, that, if you would yield just a second for me to ask you a question. It's not my time to yield. Uh, it's Mr. Armstrong, so. May I ask Mr. Massey a question? I'm wondering if you think this is helpful. Uh, I don't think it's obstructionist. I wouldn't agree with my colleague. I would think it, it does appear to be paternalistic to me, um, if you would not agree to that. Paternalistic to keep the FBI No, paternalistic bill. in making these amendments that the District of Columbia does not feel is supportive of what they believe should be in the best interest of them as a state. We wouldn't do that with other places. We didn't do that with other places who outlined what's appropriate for them. And I do understand that as a federal enclave, we need to keep the federal uh, government functioning and within our own support. But I don't think that uh, having the FBI building within that necessarily does meets the objectives that you're looking for. I, I think we need to include the FBI building. I mean, this is just common sense. There are people watching this saying, what in the world? They, they didn't include a part of the DOJ, but, but they, uh, they'll include another part of the DOJ, and both of these buildings touch the federal enclave. Just for the record, I want to introduce, if I may, uh, a, an article from the New York Times, court throws out emoluments case brought against Trump by Democrats. If there's, may I introduce? Without that? objection. Okay, mm -hmm. the, the case has been thrown out. It's, it's, it's hogwash. <laughs> and uh, I yield back to Mr. Armstrong. Uh, is there any further debate on the amendment? Hearing no further discussion. The question that now occurs on the amendment offered by the gentle uh, Amen. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed say no. no. In the opinion of the chair, the noes have it, and the amendment is not adopted. Okay. Uh, I request a recorded vote. A recorded vote has been requested. A recorded vote is so ordered. And pursuant to Clause 2 of Rule 11 and Committee uh, Rule 6D, proceedings on the amendment are postponed. Okay. Is there another amendment? Madam, Madam Chairwoman. Yes. Uh -huh. I have an amendment at the desk. Uh, the, 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 let's pause while the amendment is distributed, and then you will be recognized. Thank you. I think the, the notes that are being passed may belong to somebody else's amendment. But I'm sure they're relevant to this one. Does every member have a copy of the amendment?
Uh, the gentleman may proceed. All right. No, just uh, a moment, just a moment. The clerk will report the amendment. I repeat, the clerk will report the amendment. Amendment to HR 5803 offered by Mr. Massey of Kentucky. Without objection, the reading of the amendment is dispensed with. The gentlelady is, rec the gentleman, I'm sorry, is recognized to explain his amendment. Well, it's uh, with great joy and anticipation that I offer this amendment uh, and look forward to some dialogue with my colleague, Mr. Raskin, because we've talked about this issue before. On the other side of the aisle, they frequently discuss how uh, putting any sort of impediment into achieving a constitutional right disenfranchises uh, the poor. For instance, if there's a cost impediment or if there's a language impediment, maybe there are people who, don't, who are minorities who don't have English as their first language and so uh, the left has vociferously opposed any, any sort of thing that would bring some uh, security to our voting in this country. What I, and, I, and I'm sympathetic to some of Mr. Raskin's comments in the past about on this topic, and we've, we've discussed this before. All of the same arguments that are made by the left in terms of having fees, or requirements or tests or language barriers in order to vote apply to the Second Amendment. Like every time you put a barrier into uh, exercising your Second Amendment, you disenfranchise the poor. And this is what this amendment is about. It says that the new state shall have in their constitution a statement that says, the state of Washington, Douglas, Commonwealth, may not require a fee or assessment in order to vote or to carry a concealed firearm in the state. Now again, this is, I'm trying to reach across the aisle to my colleagues and say that we, we shouldn't throw up barriers in front of exercising uh, constitutional rights. Now, if you want to have a, if you want to really require a photo, photo ID to carry a firearm in the new state, well, then the government should pay for that. Otherwise, you're, you're, you're basically discriminating against the poor. So you could require, a, with this constitutional amendment to the new state, you could have a requirement of a photo ID, but you can't have a requirement that you have to take a test to get that photo ID or that you have to pay money because that disenfranchises uh, a segment of our population. And so that's what my amendment would do. It would guarantee that the new state doesn't impose fees or testing in order to vote or carry a concealed firearm in the state. And I yield back. Madam Chair. Oh, well, I recognize Madam Chair. I, I recognize myself for five minutes. I don't know if the, this is at least the second, it may be the third amendment that is trying to impose conditions on the new state. Um, that, of course, would be unconstitutional. Um, Essentially, what this uh, uh, on the new state. Essentially, what this, the gentleman is trying to do to the new state is what he has consistently tried to do to the District of Columbia. He, uh, and that is uh, to overturn the gun laws in, in particular uh, of the new state. Just as time and again, we have kept the gentleman from doing the very same thing, you know, such as concealed carry laws, for example, uh, or any of the laws. And he has been a multiple uh, offender on the matter of trying to impose his own views on guns on the District of Columbia. Uh, you cannot impose conditions on a new state the way you have consistently 
tried to do to the District of Columbia. The gun amendment is one of only two amendments that I've not been able to get off the D.C. appropriation. And I tell you, we're not going to have uh, and cannot have uh, that constitutional uh, of objection uh, in the new state. If you want a direct reference to why you can't speak to, much less impose, uh, your view of gun laws on the new states, I would refer you to the equal footing doctrine of the Constitution of the United States. That doctrine keeps Congress from imposing conditions on new states uh, that cannot be imposed on existing states. You cannot impose gun measures as you would like them on any other state. Dozens of states have their own gun laws. You will not be able to do that on the new state when there is a new state. Um, I reserve. Uh, I, I, I yield back uh, and recognize Mr. Raskin. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move to strike the last word. Um, and the gentleman correctly anticipated my response to this. Uh, First is the problem of the equal footing doctrine, which uh, Representative Norton just invoked. The equal footing doctrine is a really important principle in our history. It says not only that you can't impose unique mandates on particular states, but you also can't impose mandates on all the new states that are different from what applied to the original 13. So all have to be admitted at the same level of equity. And you see, of course, how um, your uh, proposition, however well-intentioned, or even how, uh, how good it might be in your mind as a policy innovation, violates the equal footing doctrine by imposing this unique mandate um, on this particular state. Um, as it stands, of course, uh, you advance uh, a controversial, if not radical, proposition. Um, you, uh, you start off with um, the unexceptionable point that we cannot impose uh, a, uh, a fee on voting, a so-called poll tax. The Supreme Court struck that down in 1966 in a case called Harper versus Virginia Board of Elections, and it, it cuts against the 24th Amendment, which explicitly banned it. There is no Supreme Court decision which says that you can't charge people uh, for the purposes of various kinds of firearm regulations, including for a concealed carry license. And Lots of states, both those whose um, gun policies you might favor as well as those you might disfavor, impose precisely such a fee. If you wanted to impose federal legislation to apply across the board in America to say you can't charge people a fee for a concealed carry license, I think you would have a rebellion among the states which are uh, doing that. But in any event, that wouldn't run afoul of the equal footing doctrine. I'm not quite sure what the federal interest is that you would be um, asserting to justify that. I don't know if that would be a Commerce Clause argument or some kind of uh, newfangled Second Amendment uh, principle. But in any event, um, you could try to do it as a federal law, or you could try to do it as a constitutional amendment um, if you really wanted to advance that proposition. But right now, I think 30 states have their own individual reciprocity agreements with other states. My state, Maryland, has it with a number of other states. Um, but some states don't like the other states' laws. They find them too restrictive, or they find them way too open-ended and permissive in terms of ability to get uh, a concealed carry license. So why not just let federalism operate and leave it to them? In any event, this is a naked violation of the equal footing doctrine. And I'm happy to yield back, Madam Chair. Does anyone uh, seek further recognition? Yeah, Madam Chair. Mr. Host. Mr. Host? No, you're going to yield to me. Yeah. Am I recognized? Yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I appreciate the, the gentleman's amendment and the context with which he brings it to the floor where we don't want to infringe upon people's ability to exercise various rights, whether it's voting or whatever. And he has made that argument very clear. And my colleagues on the other side have been staunch in defending those rights in such a way that 
that people are able to exercise certain liberties. I would argue that every state that's ever been admitted to the Union has had requirements in order to be here, and they're called the Bill of Rights. There's not a state that's ever come into this Union that has not had to submit to the Bill of Rights, and among those is the Second Amendment, which says the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. And that's a key word, infringed. What does that mean? Well, obviously, when, when we have people required to jump through loops and hoops to exercise their Second Amendment rights, it is being infringed upon. And uh, every state that has ever become part of the Union has had to submit to uh, the Bill of Rights. And with that, I do want to yield the remainder of my time to the gentleman from Kentucky. Well, uh, I, I appreciate that Mr. Raskin and I have had this discussion before. Independent of all the, the legal and the parliamentary issues here, at least I hope we can agree that whenever you impose a fee on exercising a right or anything, it, it diminishes uh, the amount that that is exercised. And statistically, this is shown. In the states where they impose high fees for getting a concealed carry permit, fewer minorities and fewer of the poor participate in that. And that's one of the things I'm trying to address here. The other thing is, we're not imposing this on a state. We have absolute authority, according to the Constitution, over the District of Columbia. And we are imposing this on the District of Columbia as a condition before this becomes a state. Uh, and one other thing that I wanted to correct or just clarify, the gentleman mentioned reciprocity. The amendment that I offered is not reciprocity. The amendment that I offer is basically a restatement of the Second Amendment, and it would be better characterized as constitutional carry. In other words, the Constitution is your permit, and that you don't go ask the government for permission. And then finally, I want to speak to something that the chairwoman spoke to. She accused me of, of trying to assist in overturning DC's gun laws. Well, I didn't just try, we accomplished that. Like half a dozen of DC's gun laws have been overturned since I have been in Congress and leading this charge as much as I can from the floor of the House. Washington DC is now a shall issue district. You can go get your concealed carry permit with 16 hours of training. And that is one of the consequences of my effort over the past seven years. In fact, they decided not to appeal it to the Supreme Court. Why did they not do it? Why did the District of Columbia not appeal the overturning of their last unconstitutional gun law to the Supreme Court? Because they knew it was unconstitutional. And states like Illinois and New York and Hawaii called them up, said, please don't appeal this to the Supreme Court, you're going to lose. You've lost every case that well, you've taken, yield. not just yet, but I will in a second. You've lost every case that you've taken to the Supreme Court, Washington, D.C. You've lost cases in your own jurisdiction. With liberal judges, you have not a chance at the Supreme Court. And if you lose there, we're going to have to be shall issue. We're going to have to acknowledge the Constitution. We're going to have to acknowledge the Second Amendment. So please, just take your lumps. Take your lumps, District of Columbia. That is what the other states, the liberal states, said to the District of Columbia. And what did they say? Okay, we'll do it. We'll start issuing permits. We'll overturn our gun law. This will be like the sixth gun law, unconstitutional one, that they've that's been overturned since I've been in Congress. And so please don't accuse me of trying. Please accuse me of accomplishing if I've had any part in overturning well, your unconstitutional you gun haven't laws. Had, you haven't had much law. The District of Columbia continues Mr. to have time. the strongest gun laws in well, the United States. Let me uh, reclaim you. There, uh, you can go get these now because these are, these are concealed carry permits, these are firearms permits in Washington, D.C. You can go get them as of 2016, 2017 because the laws were so unconstitutional, they were struck down, they were so unconstitutional that you didn't appeal them to the Supreme Court. And so I, I applaud the fact that people in, in Washington, D.C. can exercise their Second Amendment. And what we're trying to do here with this amendment is to get the new state off on the right footing. It's a gift. Here's the Second Amendment. We're restating it. Don't pass the horrible laws that D.C. did. They'll just get overturned. I yield back. I thank the gentleman, and I yield back. I, I recognize the gentlelady from California. Um, I yield my time to um, uh, my colleague, Ms. Norton. Uh, I thank the gentlelady for yielding. 
the fact is that despite countless attempts, I think uh, that the, the other side has almost given up on trying to overturn the gun laws. And the, what the, the, the gentleman has tried to do, along with his colleagues, is to wipe out all the gun laws of the District of Columbia. Uh, in fact, the District of Columbia today has the strongest gun safety laws in the United States. He has not been successful despite the small footprints he has had because the matter did not go forward. Uh, and again, I want to say to members who are trying to impose conditions on the new state, please observe the equal footing doctrine. That doctrine keeps you, keeps this body from imposing any conditions on the new state. You will have to go to the state legislature to argue this matter out. Uh, Madam Chair. With, with the gentleman yield? Uh, the, the, I, I recognize the, the, the general, gentleman. He has not spoken before. Yeah. Um, he just took some. He just took Ms. Porter. Okay. I recognize the, the gentleman from uh, Maryland. Thank you, Madam Chair, for yielding. Um, so the, the, my, my friend from Kentucky um, displayed real glee in holding up, I guess that's a concealed carry permit. Uh, is it in, from the District of Columbia? It is, it is from the uh, District of Columbia, and thousands of people have these now because we, in spite of Ms. Norton's claims to the contrary, their unconstitutional laws have been struck down. Okay. Um, and I say with utter sincerity, I hope that you will want to raise with equal glee a voter registration card that allows people in Washington, D.C. to register and vote for representatives to the United States Congress when they become a state. And I, I say that with all sincerity because, you know, the framers talked about um, three things uh, as part of citizenship. This, this will be to your liking, Mr. Massey. Uh, they talked about the ballot box. They talked about the jury box. And they talked about the cartridge box. The ballot box is how we establish our essential rights of citizenship, to be in a relationship with government where the consent of the governed rules. The jury box is where we all participate as a matter of civic duty to make sure that justice is done in every case, in actual criminal cases and civil controversies that take place. And the cartridge box they talked about too, the right to bear arms. And uh, I don't want to deny that for one moment, but I do want to answer my friend Mr. Heiss about the Second Amendment. Because the Second Amendment doesn't say that there can be no regulation on the right to bear arms. On the contrary, if you follow the conservative Robert Court's, uh, Robert Court's interpretation of the Second Amendment in District of Columbia versus Heller, which is all about the DC handgun ban, the court said that you could not categorically ban handguns because the Second Amendment protects the right of people to have a handgun for purposes of self-defense across the country, and it protects the right of people to have a rifle for purposes of hunting and recreation. But Justice Scalia was very careful to say it doesn't protect anybody's right to obtain a firearm without passing through the regulatory screen of the government. It does not protect anybody's right to have an auto, a semi-automatic weapon, weapons of mass destruction, uh, military-style assault you, weapons. It does not protect anybody's right to carry a firearm into a public building or a school against public regulation. In other words, like every other right, including the First Amendment, the Second Amendment right exists in a neighborhood of other public interests. The gentleman yield. But by all means. The, the, the word, it, it depends on what the meaning of is is kind of a thing. What is the meaning of infringed? The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. And it is Would being you, infringed as we continue to put more regulations and more complications Well, to reclaim my time, wait, you're, you're, it sounds like you're right. making a policy argument at this point, but I want you to, to feel the force of my point that constitutionally, Justice Scalia and a majority in the Supreme Court has upheld meticulous regulation of people's rights to bear arms. That's part of what it is. Just like under the First Amendment, you have a right to go and shout outside of the White House, but not at 2 o'clock in the morning and wake the president's family on a bullhorn. In other words, all rights exist according to reasonable time, place, manner restrictions. So let's be honest with the public about what the Second Amendment says. Uh, just very robust, uh, the 
the gentleman's time has expired. Hearing no further, is there further discussion? I think the gentleman, uh, Madam Chair. I recognize yeah. the ranking member. I yield to the gentleman from Kentucky. So uh, you were talking about a cartridge box. You wouldn't limit the size of the cartridge box, would you? How do you mean? Are you asking me for my? No, let me ask you. It's not a. It's not a hearing about gun regulation in the District of Columbia. That's going to be up to the people of the new state to determine. And I think that you would not want them dictating Kentucky your firearms laws. They don't want you dictating to them what their firearms laws I, are. I it's all got to be consistent with I, the Constitution, and that's what the federal courts are for. Under, I understand the point of your uh, thesis there, uh, when you, and I'm glad to hear you quoting Scalia and Roberts. Would you? I have no choice. They were in the majority. <laughs> <laughs> with, with, if you're going to embrace that decision, would you embrace the central thesis? that the right to keep and bear arms is not dependent on membership in a militia, because that was the central thesis of that Supreme Court decision of Heller, D.C. versus Heller. And I found the dissenters' argument... Uh, whoa, much, whoa, whoa. I, I found the dissenters' argument much more consistent with the textual uh, bases of the Second Amendment. It says, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the survival of a free state, comma, the right of the people to keep and bear arms should not be infringed. And I was moved by that, and I was persuaded by the dissenters' argument. But nonetheless, I accept the majority's argument because they gave such ample room for the state governments and the local governments to regulate consistent with the public right. safety. Reclaiming my time, I am glad to hear that you accept the, the majority's argument in the Supreme Court that the right to keep and bear arms is not dependent on membership in a militia. Because I keep having that debate with certain people who've never read that D.C. versus Heller decision. So anybody watching this today who doesn't have time to read that decision can understand that at least Mr. Raskin has read that decision and understands that your right to keep and bear arms is not connected or dependent upon membership in a militia. And if I might, could I ask you, do you accept all of the Supreme Court decisions which say that the right to vote is fundamental and preservative of all of the other rights? I think it's fundamental. And I also believe that, uh, and, and this is stated in the amendment that I offered, right, right? getting back to it, that um, we shouldn't require a fee or an assessment to vote, and we shouldn't require a fee or an assessment to exercise your Second Amendment. And with that, but, uh, I, you'll... I, 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 thank you, and I just wanted to thank the gentleman from Kentucky for his leadership on the Second Amendment um, in this, in all the Congresses he's been a part of. This amendment is simple. No poll tax, no Second Amendment tax. Don't infringe on the right to bear arms. Don't infringe on the fundamental right to vote. That simple. Why would anyone be opposed to it? It is that basic. So I urge yes, vote on the amendment and yield back. Hearing no further discussion, the question now occurs on the amendment offered by the, gentle, the gentleman uh, from Kentucky. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed say no. No. In the opinion of the chair, the noes have it. Madam the, Chair. The amendment is not adopted. I recognize the gentleman. I would like to request a recorded vote. A recorded vote has been requested. A recorded vote is so ordered and pursuant to Clause 2 of Rule 11 and Committee Rule 6D. Proceedings on the amendment are postponed. No further discussion. Let's move on. Madam Chair. Yes. I have an amendment at the desk. Who has, uh, I, I, I will pause, let us pause while the amendment is distributed, distributed so we can all. For the clerk's purposes, this is for section 314.
The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment to H.R. 5803 offered by Mr. Higgins of Louisiana. Without objection, the reading of the amendment is dispensed with. The, general, the, the gentleman is recognized to explain his amendment. Thank you, Madam Chair. Although I do not support the underlying bill, and I believe that uh, the, the intentions and endeavors of our citizenry that we've sworn to serve that seek the addition of D.C. as a as a 51st state, I don't believe their purposes have been well served today. So although I do not support the underlying bill, I am concerned about should this bill perhaps move forward and become law, I'm concerned about law enforcement jurisdictional authorities across these new lines. This amendment would require the new, new state to take custody of its current and all future inmates within 180 days of statehood. Under current law, D.C. prisoners are placed into the custody of the Federal Bureau of Prisons. According to some estimates, between 6,000 and 8,000 district residents are incarcerated in federal prisons with American taxpayers paying that bill. Should D.C. seek statehood, it's imperative the city be prepared to handle all such responsibilities associated with states. If they, I would submit that if they cannot perform this function of taking care of their own inmates within 180 days, then it's perhaps not ready for statehood. Uh, for example, an ICE detainer, a uh, custody detainer is 48 hours, and a common jurisdictional authority investigative detainer is commonly no longer than 10 days. So 180 days for a new state to assume responsibility of prisoners that fall within its jurisdictional authority should this law move forward is common sense. So I ask my colleagues to support the bill, to the, the amendment to the bill. Uh, would the gentleman from Louisiana yield? That would be my great honor to yield to my I colleague. Can yield. Yielding, okay. You know, I, uh, I find your amendment to be somewhat retroactive to what has occurred over since its creation, the district's creation, uh, where uh, inmates were taken into federal prisons because it's a federal enclave, you know. I don't, um, and I find your amendment to be unreasonable and impractical when you think about it. I, I, I'd like for your colleagues on, on your side to ask your staffers who happen to live in the District of Columbia, um, what is their position on statehood for the district? I mean, they are here when we're not. When we go home on the weekends, they live here year round. When we're gone in August, they are here. Uh, and during that month, if we are at home or, or or somewhere else, uh, and 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 I'd Would be the curious, allow me I'd to, be curious to know how they feel about their right to vote and have representation. Would the gentleman the allow me to reclaim my time? Uh, sure. I, I have clearly stated, sir, that I do not support the underlying bill, and I do not believe that Endeavor's greater purpose has been served well this day. What I am suggesting is that should this this flawed bill move forward, which in my opinion, uh, despite my colleagues, my constitutional scholar colleagues' uh, contrary opinion, I believe this endeavor would, would call for a constitutional amendment. Mm -hmm. That directly means that this endeavor today does not serve the purpose that it is stated to serve. However, should it move forward, which I don't believe it will, I think law enforcement and the continuity of relations between jurisdictional authorities, including the responsibility to humanely and properly within, within constitutional parameters care for those inmates, I believe that needs to be a clear line in the sand assumed by any proposed new state. And, now and, and if the gentleman would continue to yield, you and I know how impractical this amendment is because how, how long does it take? 
to stand up and be, to build a prison. To stand yeah, I would up a I prison. would disagree with and that. You, but you know I, that I would look forward to working with my colleague yeah, to address you, this issue. You agree, at some, and, at some future and, and really, I find it quite paternalistic on the part of you and the other sponsors of these this, um, these amendments uh, to try to dictate from top down how people are going to live uh, in this community once they become a state. We're responsible to provide care for our inmates, good sir. Madam Chair, I yield. I thank the gentleman for yielding, and I, I, uh, I grant myself uh, five minutes to respond. What this bill does is to require the state six, to, to take uh, over all of the, its responsibilities within six months and to repay the government anything it would be owed within three years. Now, this is, uh, first of all, a, a, a provision of, of a kind never imposed on any new state. But perhaps more importantly, what this amendment does is to eliminate transition assistance. No state has just come willy-nilly willy into uh, the government. Um, the Transition, trans, what, what is called transition assistance, some assistance to the new state has been the case ever since 1803 when Ohio was admitted to the Union. Uh, this transition assistance, as the state gradually moves to become a full state from, in most cases, a, a territory, this transition uh, assistance uh, obviously dissipates as more and more functions are taken over. And so what, what does transition assistance mean? Examples in the past for states who have come into the union have been indirect monetary aid, land grants, partial exemption from federal taxes, and other special a statutory treatment. And so I look at what happened when the gentleman's state, Louisiana, came into the union. L uh, Louisiana received uh, cash grants from the sale of federal lands within the state. Louisiana received 5% of the net proceeds from federal land marked for construction uh, of roads. Every state has needed transition assistance. There's no reason that the district alone should not get that assistance. And I yield back. Is there anybody else who wants to speak on this amendment? Hearing no further discussion, the question now occurs on the amendment offered by the gentleman uh, from Louisiana. All those in favor say aye. All those opposed say no. Yeah. In the opinion of the chair, the noes have it, and the amendment is not adopted. A recorded vote has been requested. A recorded vote is so ordered, and pursuant to Clause 2 of Rule 11 and Committee Rule 60, proceedings on the amendment are postponed. Any further amendments? The gentleman from Louisiana is recognized. Uh, uh, again, and we will pause while the amendment is distributed. This amendment is unnecessary. The new state has the authority to enter into agreements with federal police, just like every state does. Are we ready? The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment to H.R. 5803 offered by Mr. Higgins of Louisiana. Without objection, the reading of the amendment is dispensed with. 
Gentleman is recognized to explain his amendment. Thank you, Madam Chair. This is uh, another amendment that I offer to an underlying bill that I do not support, strictly based upon concerns regarding law enforcement and the continuity of services in an efficient and effective manner across jurisdictional authorities. This amendment directs federal law enforcement entities to uphold existing cross-jurisdictional agreements and authorizes a negotiation of a new protective service agreement that is called for. Adjoining jurisdictions routinely enter into cross-jurisdictional agreements to ensure orderly policy of border areas. It's imperative that existing functioning agreements between federal and D.C. law enforcement not be jeopardized by any proposed new state. Specifically, it's critical that we preserve law enforcement's ability to provide protective services, such as motorcades, et cetera, to residents and visitors. Although I strongly oppose the underlying legislation, should it pass through this committee and ultimately become law, it's necessary to limit any repercussions regarding the safety and services that law enforcement provides to the citizens thereof and those that visit our nation's capital. The safety of the American public should be a bipartisan endeavor, and I ask my colleagues to support this amendment to the underlying legislation. I'd also like to add, Madam Chair, that uh, respectfully regarding statements made that refer to the assistance to the states and and municipalities thereof from the from treasures harvested by the federal government from the people that live within the sovereign states. What has changed over the last several decades is the existence of massive bureaucracies that manage hundreds, even thousands upon thousands of grant processes that allow states uh, and municipalities to seek assistance from the federal government. Whereas in times past, historically, uh, most, if not all, of these current grant assistance programs did not exist at the time uh, new states were brought into the Union, certainly Louisiana. So may I submit, again respectfully, that should and what's currently known as the, our nation's capital uh, become a 51st state, then that state will have access to federal grant assistance, just as all the other sovereign states have access. There will be no denial of that. There's the means by which this access is, uh, is, is, is determined and sought by a sovereign state has changed over the decades, but there's nothing in my amendment or any other that would stop a new state from accessing those funds in the same manner. And I yield the balance of my time to the ranking member. Thank the gentleman for his, um, for his good amendment and, and just as importantly for his service to, uh, in, uh, in law enforcement and would urge the adoption of the, uh, of the gentleman's amendment. I yield back. Uh, I recognize uh, the gentleman yields back, and I recognize myself of uh, four or five minutes. Actually, the gentleman spoke to his prior amendment as well. Um, what you're calling grant assistance assistant programs, uh, when it came to new states issued in, uh, entering into the union, uh, has simply meant that the Congress has granted an amount, not a grant, it's an amount to help with the transition. Uh, and that's why I quoted Louisiana, who got considerable funds to help with its transitions. It's not a grant. It's, it, 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 Congress has to consider it. What does the new state really need in funds in order to make an orderly transition into the union? As to his amendment, which is now on the floor, he should be pleased, the gentleman from Louisiana should be pleased to learn that his amendment is unnecessary because the new state 
has the authority to enter into agreements with the federal police forces the way his state does and the way every state does. So we don't need an amendment to assure that the park police and the other police you reference may enter, uh, have, may have jurisdiction in the new state. Uh, are there any other, uh, is anybody else wish to speak to the gentleman's amendment? Hearing none, we will move to the next amendment. The question now occurs, sorry, on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Louisiana. All those in favor say aye. aye. Uh, opposed say no, no. In the opinion of the chair, the noes have it and the amendment is not adopted. A recorded vote has been requested. It, uh, is a recorded vote requested, as will surely be the case. A recorded <laughs> vote has been requested. A recorded vote is so ordered and pursuant to clause two of rule 11, and Committee Rule 60 proceedings on the amendment are postponed. Oh, good. Okay. Any other uh, amendments? Madam Chair, I have an amendment yes. at the desk. Please pause while the amendment is distributed. For, for the information of all the members, floor votes are expected at 1.30 or perhaps 1.45. We will recess when those votes are called and reconvene in one hour. Uh, and I will clarify what one hour means. Uh, please use this opportunity to get lunch and return promptly to the committee. We will recess when those votes are called and reconvene in one hour uh, after the last vote. No, 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 either 2.30 or 2.45. Well, then, no, oh, excuse me. To make it, since we don't know at what time the last vote will occur, yeah. uh, it will either be 2.30 or 2.45 whenever that vote is called. We'll let you know when you recess. We'll let you know before you leave to vote, okay. as we are seeking to do by getting this statehood bill passed. Okay. Everyone has the amendments, so the clerk can report. Everyone has the amendments. The clerk will read the amendment. Amendment to H.R. 5803, offered by Mr. Heiss of Georgia. It's dispensed with. The, general, uh, the, the, the gentle man is recognized to explain his amendment. Thank you, Madam Chair. The District of Columbia is a sanctuary city, which means, in essence, that it is a jurisdiction that refuses to cooperate with federal immigration laws. And although the uh, district is a federally controlled jurisdiction, uh, Congress granted the rights of home rule. Despite that, despite giving that kind of flexibility, I think it's important for all of us to recognize the reality that any city any jurisdiction, but particularly the nation's capital, carries with it responsibilities to enforce federal laws. Uh, it carries responsibilities of cooperating with federal agencies. How can anyone not recognize this? And if granted statehood, D.C. would, at least as if it acts as it currently is, this new state would actively work against federal immigration authorities. In October of this past year, D.C. Council Member Charles Allen actually introduced an emergency bill with the specific intent of avoiding congressional oversight. The so-called emergency was to ban city agencies from providing information about illegal immigrants to Immigration and Customs Enforcement, to ICE. So there was an emergency, he thought, uh, to ban the city from uh, providing information to ICE. That kind of action is, is not acceptable. The non-emergency bill, if we can call it, would also prohibit the D.C. Department of Corrections which, by the way, is paid by federal taxpayers, 
but it would prevent them from allowing federal immigration authorities to enter D.C. facilities. So Councilman Allen apparently believes that it is the right thing to do to allow illegal immigrants to remain in D.C. even though they may have committed some sort of crime. So the rub comes here. We're talking about statehood and making D.C. a state. Is it unreasonable for any of us to think that it is beyond our jurisdiction to look at a state and say, if you are going to become a state, you need to abide by federal law? Especially if that state happens to be the nation's capital. How can we, in clear conscience, proceed with this, which, in my opinion, has already been discussed as unconstitutional and would require a constitutional amendment to begin with? But assuming we go through all that, how could we admit a state that is coming out boldly saying we're not going to abide by federal law? Uh, that is... Um, something that I believe we cannot do, and this amendment uh, addresses that issue and would, would say that they would need to abide by federal law. And so I would urge support of the amendment, Madam Chair, and I yield back. Uh, I thank the gentleman for his amendment. I yield myself five minutes to respond to his amendment. Once again, we have a member trying to make law for the new state uh, before it becomes a state, which, of course, the equal footing doctrine uh, forbids. The new state is going to decide its own laws, just as 37 states entered the union, decided what their laws should be. So he's trying it this time. And here, here we have another attempt to impose a condition on the state. Uh, he's trying to impose a condition on the new state that dozens of states have already enacted for their own states. That's where the word sanctuary city comes from. Uh, now, yes, the, the district has declared itself a sanctuary city, uh, and it is in league with uh, with. Uh, jurisdictions throughout the United States. Now, the Supreme Court has held that uh, the federal government cannot commandeer uh, state and local uh, governments to enforce federal law. And that is what I want to emphasize. I understand what the federal law is. I understand that throughout the United States, jurisdictions are in violation of uh, the federal law, but the district has the same constitutional right to do so uh, as has been done by states and cities with respect to sanctuary uh, city protections uh, as I speak. Now the me member wants to say uh, on the new state, the new state cannot be, I would take it, a sanctuary state. I cite to him once again the equal footing clause which bars Congress from imposing conditions on new states uh, that cannot be imposed on existing states. Congress has not imposed this condition on existing states, and it cannot impose uh, this condition on a state yet to be formed. Are there any other? Will the gentlelady uh, yield? Would, uh, and likewise, if she would yield, I have a comment. Uh, I yield to the, to the gentleman from Maryland. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so th this is uh, yet another in um, a succession of policy riders to a statehood admission act. We have seen um, proposed amendments on abortion, on gun control, and now immigration, a series of hot button issues meant uh, to distract and inflame rather than uh, enlighten what this discussion is really about. Some of my colleagues, I think uh, our distinguished ranking member, took umbrage to my describing this as political graffiti. And I, I suppose it is something of an insult to graffiti artists who uh, at least uh, 
have a, a, a creative uh, artistic intention in what they're doing, I fear that this is much more propagandistic. Um, if you think that you can get a national law passed banning abortion, which I know is uh, a position taken in good faith by some of my colleagues, if, if you think you can wipe out all of the gun safety laws of the various jurisdictions, if you think you can squelch the sanctuary policies that have been adopted in various states, then introduce federal legislation to do it and have it apply to the whole country. But it's very clear that as a matter of constitutional law, under the equal footing doctrine, you cannot impose these unique mandates on the admission of a single state. Um, and there's very interesting Supreme Court case law on this. There's a case that I seem to remember, is, I think it's called the Coyle decision relating to the admission of Oklahoma, where the uh, Congress actually got involved in trying to micromanage where Oklahoma was gonna site its capital city. And the Supreme Court said, you can't do that. It's up to the state itself. So you'll notice that all of these policy riders that uh, they're attempting to paste on a statehood admission um, relate to national policy questions where they've been unable to get their position well, the adopted yield. by the Congress of the United States. Well, the gentleman yield. It's not my time, but I'm happy to yield back to the chair for that purpose. The chair yield. Uh, I yield to the gentleman. Thank you. I, listen, I, I take offense at, at the comment that this is an, it, that it is inflammatory to ask a state to abide by the law. To me, what is inflammatory or is for us to turn our head and ignore the request to ask other states to abide by the law. This is, we, we are not, we are simply asking a state to abide by the law. How is that inflammatory? And I know the time has expired, uh, and so I thank the gentlelady for yielding. Madam Chair. I, I, recognize, the, I, I recognize the ranking member. Yeah, the question, th 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 I think the chair, the, the question before us is real simple. We're being asked, are we going to vote for a piece of legislation that would allow D.C. to become a state? And the gentleman's amendment says, before we decide that question, it kind of would make some sense if the entity we're talking about becoming a state would actually follow federal immigration law. That's the simple question. And you can call it all kinds of names. Mr. Raskin can continue to refer to it as graffiti. But I'll go back to the point I made. Protecting a newborn child's life is not graffiti. Protecting the Second Amendment in our Bill of Rights, in our Constitution, is not graffiti. And saying that if you're going to join this amazing union we call the United States of America and become a state, it might help if you would respect federal immigration law prior to us deciding on that question. That's all, we're, that's all we've done today. That's real. Now, you can have all the fancy arguments you want, Mr. Law Professor, but that's all we're doing, and you can call it every name you want to call it. That is all the type of amendments we have offered from our side. They all seem to me to be pretty darn common sense. And once again, I would say I urge the support of the gentleman from George's amendment. And frankly, if the gentleman wants a little more time, I'm happy to, happy to yield. I thank the gentleman. And I, and I would just say, too, the, the whole notion that we don't require states to abide by certain preconditions is in itself false. That's why we have the Bill of Rights. And no state becomes a state without agreeing that they are going to abide and grant the citizens of that state certain rights. Well, the gentleman Among yield. them are the Bill of Rights. And, and so why is it any different for us to say we have some federal laws? There's also important for you to abide by as well. And yes, I'll be happy to yield. So I think you ask the crucial question when you say, well, why is it different to ask entering states to abide by the Bill of Rights versus abide by a particular policy on abortion or gun control or immigration? Um, of course, we ask all of the states to abide by the Bill of Rights and the rest of the Constitution. That is the equal footing doctrine. It requires all of the states to comply with the Constitution of the United States. But with respect to particular policies under the Tenth Amendment that are decided by the state governments themselves, they are free to do that. The Supreme Court's been very clear about it. In other words, we can't uh, dictate to them on the way in. And by the way, if you really want to be an equal citizen, you have to accept our position on X, Y, or Z policy as opposed to the Constitution itself. Well, I thank the gentleman. I will reclaim my time. It is not a policy issue when we're talking federal law, though. And, and individuals nor states have the right 
to cherry pick what laws are going to abide with, by with and what laws they're not going to abide. With, with General and, and so I, I will in just a moment, Matt. Um, and so what we're talking about here is simply saying to a potentially new state, will you abide by federal law? That's not a difficult question, and I do yield to the chair. Uh, I say to the gentleman on sanctuary cities, I think your underlying point, point may be valid, but the state seeks to be treated just as other states. It has the right to be treated just as other states with respect to sanctuary cities as well. And sanctuary cities are all over the United States. Federal government, the Congress of the United States has done nothing to keep any state from becoming a sanctuary city. That would And be reclaiming my time, Madam Chair, uh, yes, sanctuary cities are all over the, the nation. So are criminals. That doesn't make it right. And because we have federal laws to try to address, listen, I know that the, the, this issue would not get rid of all criminals. I'm not trying to apply that. But we know we, we have a problem here. And for us to continue to turn our faces away from cities and or states from abiding by federal law is irresponsible on our part. And it is the least of questions that should be asked before we admit any state into this union. And I yield back. Move straight to the last word. He, he's asked, I'm sorry, did you yield to the gentleman? Oh, I'm moving to strike the last word to be recognized. I, I recognize the gentleman from Maryland. Thank you. I, I think that this has been an excellent discussion, and I appreciate the spirit with which it's offered by, by Mr. Heiss. Um, but let me say a couple of things. First of all, the, the term sanctuary city or jurisdiction means different things in different places. And in some places, it means we just want to welcome people and we're not going to turn people away. Others have more controversial meanings, and some of them, I'm sure, uh, are at the edge of the law, as you would see it, but many of them are not. And so I, I don't know that there is one specific federal statutory definition of what a, a sanctuary city is. In any event, the critical point, as with abortion, as with gun safety, is if you think you've got an excellent policy that should override the state and local governments in the development of their own policies, let's introduce it in Congress and then have the representatives of the people from all 50 or 51 or 52 states, depending on what happens with Puerto Rico, vote on it. That is the federal system. And sometimes people say, no, leave it up to the states. And sometimes people say, no, it's a matter of such importance. We're going to override the states and we're going to impose one rule on it. But certainly, don't tag, don't tag a statehood admission process as the opportunity to intervene on this. At least, I, I think there's a problem with that. It would be one thing if what um, you're saying is, I support statehood for 700,000 taxpaying draftable people who want to be represented in Congress. I support it, but I feel so strongly about one of these issues that I'm going to try to attach it as a writer. Well, then maybe there's something to discuss. But I don't hear that from any of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle. They seem to be saying, I'm going to vote against it, even if I get everything that I want in terms of these fundamentally important issues of abortion and immigration and gun safety. Even if you pass exactly what I think is right, I'm still going to vote against the Democratic representation and voting rights of the people um, in New Columbia. I, I think that that's a problematic posture to have. That's why, to me, it feels like it's ideological graffiti. It's not meant to seriously contribute to the statehood process that all of our states have gone through, except for the original 13, and I'm proud to represent one of those original 13. But the other 37 have come through a process which is governed by the equal footing doctrine, which is they are presenting a proposition, which is they want to be in the union on the basis of political equality. And the Supreme Court has said, you can't start that entrance and that admission to equality by burdening them with selective policy impositions by other people's representatives. So, um, with the gentleman yield? Yes, by all means. Uh, and I thank, I thank my friend for yielding. Uh, my friend seems to imply or believe that if I disagree with the underlying policy, that I'm wrong to offer an amendment. I do not believe it was the intent of our founders for D.C. to be a state. Nothing you or anyone else can say can change my mind on that. I disagree with that policy, period. Nonetheless, uh, your, your side is moving forward with this. So my only, our response is to try to make it less bad 
than what it already is. Okay, can I try so to convince is, you so on the underlying point? If I just to reclaim my time for a second, I'm going to try to pursue the point you raised because you raise a serious point. You say you don't think it was the intention of the founders to turn D.C. into a state. Okay. Um, it was certainly not the intention of the founders to have the constitutional seat of government itself become a state. But it was their intention, as clearly manifested in the text of Article 1, Section 8, Clause 17, to give Congress the power to govern on all matters respecting the seat of government, including the size of it, the governance of it, and so on. It can be no more than 10 miles square, but it can be less than 10 miles square. So I think that um, the legislation before us today is perfectly consistent with your understanding of the founders. The purpose of the legislation is to redraw the boundaries of the seat of government, so Congress continues to exercise police power over it, over the mall area. The residential areas are then ceded to the new state so it can be admitted on a plane of equality with all other American citizens. So there we meet all of the constitutional obligations, the obligation of political equality, voting rights, democratic self-government, consent of the governed, and the power of Congress to make sure that we can guarantee the public safety within the seat of government. You know, the story that Madison used to tell was about the meeting of the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia where the disgruntled Revolutionary War soldiers showed up and were protesting for the money that they weren't paid. The Constitutional Convention called the governor of Pennsylvania and said, will you send out the militia to put these people down because it's becoming unruly, and he refused to do that. At that point, Madison said, we've got to exercise police power jurisdiction over the Capitol itself, meaning the meetings of Congress, the, the governmental functions themselves. That purpose constitutionally will be preserved under this legislation. Congress will still have police power jurisdiction over the Capitol, the White House, the federal buildings, and so on. The residential lands will be ceded to the new state so 700,000 people can get their rights and their equality. Why would any of us want to stand in the way of that? I strongly disagree, but respectfully, I disagree. I yield back. And I yield back. Hearing no further discussion. The question now occurs on the amendment offered by the, general, the gentleman from Georgia. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed say no. 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 In the opinion of the chair, the noes have it, and the amendment is not adopted. Madam Chair asks for a recorded vote. A recorded vote has been requested. A recorded vote is so ordered and pursuant to Clause 2 of Rule 11 and Committee Rule 6D. Proceedings on the amendment are postponed. Are there, is there further discussion, further amendments? Mr. Norman. Mr. Norman. Madam Chair. Have I, rec I recognize Mr. Norman. I have a member at the desk. Uh, we will pause while the amendment is distributed. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment to H.R. 5803 offered by Mr. Norman of South Carolina. Without objection, the reading of the amendment is dispensed with. The gentleman is recognized to explain his amendment. Thank you, Madam Chair. This amendment is pretty simple, and I think it's probably one that will get the approval of most every legislator in this room that's voting. And uh, it's, it has to do with a right to, to work. South Carolina, which is where I'm from, uh, attracted Boeing, which is a great industry, who came to South Carolina because uh, their employees were allow, allowed to choose. Do they want to get in a, a join a union or do they not want to join a union? So uh, my proposed amendment would, you know, as a precondition of, of admission, that D.C. amend the proposed state constitution to include a policy 
to acquire the new state, become a right-to-work state, such as South Carolina. Uh, and as I mentioned, right-to-work laws allow employees to decide for themselves whether they wish to participate or not. Um, there are 23 states that uh, employees can either be fired or discriminated against in hiring practices if, they, if the potential employees refuse to join the Associated Labor Union. When given the choice, and this is what this is about, is choice, uh, many people do not wish to join a union. They don't want uh, their salaries deducted uh, for the dues membership. That's their right. Uh, in 1983, the, the proportion of the workforce that belongs to a union has fallen nearly in half. That goes to show you that people are not choosing to join a union. Equally, if they decide that they would like to join a union, they can voluntarily do so and not be compelled to do it. Um, this change has not been seen in the private sector due to the current laws that require many employees to participate in, in unions. Uh, government employees should not be granted more protections under the First Amendment than private sector employees. Uh, and again, all Americans should have the right to determine if they like a union or not. If granted statehood, uh, which like Mr. Heiss and, uh, uh, and others, Mr. Jordan, I'm going to vote against this. I think it's wrong the way it's being proposed. I think of all the reasons you've heard uh, debated, and we, I appreciate the debate that we've had, the, uh, to have a markup on something this huge should not take place. But um, uh, you know, if, 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 if the new state of D.C. should grant all citizens a right to work, no matter what decisions they make when it comes to joining the union, a labor union, it's an economic incentive, and uh, hopefully everyone here will agree, which I think they probably will, so I urge members to support this amendment. I yield back. Uh, I thank the gentleman for his amendment. I recognize myself for five minutes. I understand the concern of my colleagues on the other side about trade unions. Before I even speak to uh, our own Constitution, uh, which protects the right of free association uh, and it's a form in any way that is lawful. I, I'm going to cite to you the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which says everyone has the right to form and to join trade unions for the protection of his interests. This is universally recognized throughout uh, the world uh, and is certainly uh, authorized by the, the First Amendment. But what this is is yet another attempt to impose a con condition on the state uh, before it becomes a state. In order to become a state, this is what you m must do. I can understand why my Republican colleagues are doing this, because they habitually do it every time the D.C. appropriation comes up, and they don't want to give up that right. So they're trying to keep it even so they can do it uh, as a matter of st state. And so here they would actually forbid the state from uh, something that uh, is not only First Amendment matter, but that is done um, every day. And that is the state from allowing the employer uh, and a labor organization to enter into an agreement. Yes, requiring membership, in, requiring membership, and that's the, the rub for the gentleman in a labor union. And, and of course, that is still the law in many states. I want to quote to the gentleman Coyle versus Smith. That's the Supreme Court decision that struck down a condition imposed on the new state of Oklahoma, saying, and here I want to quote, the Constitution the constitutional equality of the states is essential to the harmonious operation of the scheme upon which the republic was organized. End quote. Supreme Court of the United States. This has been tried before. It was tried with respect to the state of Oklahoma. The Supreme Court uh, indeed uh, spoke definitively, if you want a new state, uh, you have notions about what you want the new state, you will have to go to the new state. You will not be able to do it 
as a matter of law on a statehood bill at this time. Anybody else want to speak? Madam Chair. I, at this moment, I, I yield back uh, and I yield to the ranking. Yeah, and I'll, I'll be brief. I know votes have been called, but in, in the Chair's comments, the first thing she said was the right to free association. That's exactly what the amendment does. I mean, I'm all for if, if you want to join a union, God bless you. My dad was a union member. I've been, I got nothing against that. But you shouldn't be com compelled to do it. It shouldn't be compulsory. That's all the gentleman's amendment says. If you want free association, support this amendment. That's the first thing you said in your statement, free association. We're all for that. But you shouldn't be forced to join a union. That's all the gentleman's amendment says, and I would urge the adoption of the amendment. I yield back. Uh, I, I yield. I, I call upon the uh, gentleman from Maryland. Thank you, <clears throat> Madam Chair, and I move to strike the last word. Um, this train of right-wing amendments shows us precisely why the people of Washington need to be admitted to the Union. 700,000 Americans do not want to get run over any longer by anti-choice, anti-immigration, anti-gun safety, union-busting agendas from other parts of the country. So the caboose is now the right to work laws. Uh, they have failed in uh, trying to um, impose uh, a union busting right to work policy across the whole country, um, but they want to impose it on the new state in direct violation, again, of the equal footing doctrine. You can't impose on one state what does not apply to all of the states. Um, but uh, I hope that this hearing will be uh, a tutorial to the country about why hundreds of thousands of taxpaying draftable citizens in Washington, D.C. are petitioning government for admission to the union. Because depending on who's in power in Congress, uh, their local policies on things like abortion, uh, things like marriage equality, things like adoption, have been micromanaged by other people's representatives. And Madam Chair, that's what the American Revolution was about. The, the crown during the American Revolution said, oh, people in the colonies are represented. They're represented by other people's representatives in England because they know what they want. So we got a bunch of representatives from other parts of America who are telling people petitioning for their statehood and their political equality, what's best for them. That's an absolute offense to democracy. That's an injury to democratic self-government, and it's an assault on liberty. I think the people in the nation's capital who have been long suffering under this system have shown remarkable patience and forbearance for these political games. I certainly wouldn't put up with it. I don't, I don't know uh, anybody on this committee who would put up with it in terms of their own constituents. So why are we asking them to put up with it? Fellow Americans. Um, Madam Chair, I, I hope that this hearing really becomes a, a seminar for the country in understanding what these people are putting up with in terms of having other people's representatives dictate to them their policies and their laws. That's wrong. I yield back. The vote has been called. I want to say to the gentleman, uh, the reason we, quote, put up with it is because we are not a state. And that is why we wish to become a state. So we'll never again have to put up with somebody else uh, enacting laws for the District of Columbia besides the residents themselves of the District of Columbia. Hearing no further discussion, the question now occurs on the amendment offered by the gentleman from South Carolina. All those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed say no. Yeah. No. In the opinion of the chair, the no's having that the amendment is not adopted. Madam, Madam Chair. I, I recognize the, gen the, the gentleman. Ask for a recorded vote. A recorded vote has been requested. A recorded vote is so ordered and pursuant to Clause 2 of Rule 11 and Committee Rule 6D. Proceedings on the amendment are postponed. 
Uh, the committee will stand in recess and will reconvene at 2.45. Yeah. Um, uh, floor votes are underway. Members should review, should return promptly at 2.45. The committee is in recess, subject to call of the chair. Gavel. Get your gavel it out. <laughs> there you go. You'd like the gavel.